before we start. I don't think there are any planned fire alarms today, so if we do hear one, uh, follow Howard and Tony, because they will be the first ones out. And, uh, yeah. and I'm sure the police will help us in, a, in a, <laughs> as well. Yeah. I always like when we have uh, the firefighters here, so if there's ever a fire, you've got some experts here on hand, but I, I'm sure we've got some trained experts as well. Um, Howard, first item on the agenda is apologies, please. Morning, Chair. Uh, we have no apologies. Yeah, good, good stuff. A full house. Uh, item two, disclosures of interest. Any disclosures of interest today? No, brilliant. That's good. Minutes of the previous meeting on the 1st of March. Uh, any comments on those? I won't go through them individually. You know, I think we had a really good meeting, uh, particularly discussing the Victorian Christmas market, but also the serious violence duty uh, and the other items, including the, the task and finish group. So um, a, a, another long meeting, but hopefully today's won't be so long. Um, any comments on those, or can I sign them at a later date? Right, thank you very much. Chairman's brief, nothing to report on that. So we can move to the, the main item on the agenda is Warwickshire Police. Uh, and I do like to confirm they are here not because of my criminal jokes, they are here to uh, give us an update on, on policing within the district. And we've got. You, you mean put them out to a wider audience? Is that so? Everybody, so we, we don't discriminate. You know, I, I know that Ben particularly loves my jokes, don't you, Ben? Um, so, gentlemen, welcome. If you'd like to come forward to the... Uh, what we're proposing to do um, is the gentleman will give us a brief update on, on the policing, particularly Stratford District and, and some of the challenges. And I'm proposing that um, we finish this item around about 10.45, uh, 10.50. So if we have about 45 minutes of, of questions, and I think that's fair, my, my only plea to, to members is that can we be succinct with our questions? And I, I appreciate a, a limited preamble will be, could be vital as part of setting the, the background for the question. Um, also, please try to be like uh, no repeats or... Yeah, don't ask the same question in a different way. And obviously, we can't, because this is uh, in public, we can't go into individual details on, on cases as well. So with those three caveats, I'm, I'm more than prepared to let people ask as many questions as they, as they can. And again, we'll, we'll take turns as well, so uh, everybody gets a fair, fair show to the, the questions. And I'll let uh, Ben and Fass carry on. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, good morning everybody. Um, just to introduce myself, because there's colleagues in the room that I don't think we've met before. So, uh, my name's Faz Fash Chisti. I am the current um, Area Commander for South Warwickshire. Um, and what that means is that I have uniform responsibility for the policing of the south of the county, which, as you'll appreciate, includes Warwick District and Stratford District. Uh, to my right is my colleague. Hello, most of you know me by face or name at least, uh, Ben Hembury, I'm the District uh, Safer Neighbourhood Team Inspector. Okay. So just, just to perhaps set, uh, set the scene really in terms of where we are in terms of policing. So um, as a, a result of a change in our operating model and our policing model last year, we went live with a new policing model for Warwickshire under our Empower programme, which was launched on the 24th of April. So we're nearly a year into that journey. Uh, the kind of pre-history um, of coming to life was that we'd been in a strategic alliance, as you know, for, for many years with West Mercia, which started um, to break down 2017-18, and the force had been on a continual journey to stand alone and re-establish itself as one force. Because whilst we were in this strategic alliance, we um, pulled resources, had shared functions uh, in order to meet the need at that moment in time. So the force has been on this continual journey. And like I said, last year, through a lot of work that had been happening 
up until that point, we launched the Empower model. Now, as a consequence of the Empower model, what that brought back to life was a geographically based policing style and m approach. Um, and we have three defined policing areas in Warwickshire, South Warwickshire, which is the area I lead, North Warwickshire, and the East. And in my service of nearly 30 years, always in Warwickshire, the, the model that's always been of certainly my liking and a favour, I think, to our local communities and partners has been based on a geographical model. And I think one of the things that we saw certainly during the Alliance was a thematic based approach. So I, I thought that was a, you know, a really good um, relaunch of what we've done. And so the last 12 months have been a period of embedding the model, bringing it to life, and actually delivering the services I think that our communities and partners would like to see. So in my uh, area of influence, I have three distinct teams. Uh, what does that look like? So I have 24-7 patrol officers, sometimes known as response officers, who deal with live 999 calls and calls that come through for calls for service. And we have a footprint of two bases where they are deployed from. The first one I'll mention is Grace Mallory, which polices our Warwick district. And for here in Stratford, we have a footprint in the police station, uh, which is obviously on Mother Street. And that um, arm of my work, they work 24 seven. We have four patrol teams, uh, 11 officers are on each team led by a dedicated sergeant. And we have two inspectors responsible for that area of business here. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have a safe neighbourhood footprint, safe neighbourhood teams. Um, and for Stratford District, we have the Stratford neighbourhood policing team based here at Stratford. We've got a footprint at Ulster. We've got a footprint at Southam. We have a footprint out physically out at uh, Shipston, uh, which collectively, collectively deliver policing in terms of safe neighbourhood into Stratford District. Now, that team consists of an inspector, which is Ben, who leads those resources. He's supported by two sergeants, eight constables, and 12 PCSOs. In addition to that, the uh, third arm of my business is what we call a patrol investigation unit, who are responsible for investigating crimes and criminality that are picked up by our response patrol officers. That enables them to be um, deployable, not being tied up with dealing with prisoners or investigations that would obviously take them away from the front line. So that um, area of my work sits within Leamington. It's led by an inspector. There are five sergeants and um, in the region of 30 police constables. So the last 12 months has um, been a journey where we've brought the model to life. Uh, we've got um, those processes embedded. Uh, as a result of also uh, of the Empower model, we've um, reopened our front offices. So we've got what we call a local policing resolution centre function. So the front office here at Stratford opens nine to five on a, mon on a Monday to Friday basis, uh, nine to four on a Saturday and 11.30 to 2.30 on a Sunday. Again, pre-Empower, um, some of our front offices were not accessible to members of the public. And I know from some of the sound bites that I picked up that actually clearly that's not what our communities or partners want as a hence. Certain strategic locations across the force, including Stratford and the Justice Centre at Leamington, are now reopened to the public. Any questions on the model or... On, on okay, so... In terms of the Stratford district then, just, just some key highlights. It's been a busy year. What I can tell you is actually overall crime was down by 2.1%. So, so that was, a, I think, a good year for us because clearly we've had um, a number of challenges we've, we've seen throughout this last 12 months. Uh, and some of the key headlines which I think it's worth bringing to your attention is the fact that in this last year, which finished on the 31st of March in terms of our performance, we had a reduction in burglaries by 9.6%, uh, a staggering reduction in vehicle crime uh, by 20% by some of the operations that we've been doing. Uh, we've had, um, obviously, um, an increase, unfortunately, in shoplifting, but that's a trend that's not just isolated to Stratford District. We've seen that not only across the south, but across the force, but also nationally, we've seen an, up, uh, an upturn in 
uh, shoplifting. We do have a, a dedicated set of resources that we call our ISO team, which are a, a, a number of officers who are dedicated to dealing with investigations, but are primarily focusing in and around shoplifting, which, when we look at the detail, has attributed to the increase in recording because um, we've now built a partnership with the Watcher Retail Crime Initiative, which has brought back to life the, the method of reporting via disk. So the, our officers are now picking up some of those crimes at source, which were, from what we've picked up, were probably going unreported. And we've targeted a number of shoplifters um, who we know are prevalent in our communities, and some of them have gone to prison. So some of our wider challenges, I think, this year have been um, around some of our young people in terms of uh, ASB. I know Ben will probably talk a little bit more about some of the hotspots that we've picked up, but we've worked tirelessly with some of our partners to try and deal with some of those issues. Um, and we've also seen a slight increase in uh, possession of offensive weapons. And I know uh, Ben's sent out some little circulated some literature to, to yourself this morning and he'll talk more about the operation and the initiative that Ben has brought to life and is driving uh, really passionately to try and re reverse the, uh, the curb on that. Uh, in terms of um, hate crime, so this year we've s seen a slight reduction in hate crime across the district and in terms of the most prevalent hate crimes that we see is normally based around race and sexual orientation. This year so far, so uh, since we started recording since March, we've had three hate crimes across the district, one race, one disability, and one transgender. But again, these figures aren't out of step for South Watch or even across the force. Any questions for me at this stage? I'll talk a brief one, take the chairman's privilege. Um, you were saying about the shoplifters um, and in other intelligence I get that the pro prolific ones uh, some of those, when they're arrested or, or go to prison, you see a, a big reduction in um, shoplifting in, in certain areas. Is that contributing to some of the falls that you mentioned, the 2.1% uh, decrease in, in crime? Yes and no, because we know some of the offenders that we deal with commit more than just shoplifting. So it's probably not fair to say that every shoplifter that we deal with is involved in wider criminality. Um, but the reality is, you know, some of the people that we have dealt with, we know are uh, not just focused on shoplifting. There are a tendency to break into vehicles or enter insecure vehicles to steal. Um, and some have also been linked to, not particularly for this district, but the south, to some of our burglary dwellings as well. So they do, some do commit wider offending as opposed to just walking into shops and helping themselves. Thank you, Chair. Um, hello, Victoria Alcock, Councillor for Bishopton Ward. The figures are, that you say are down, of, of that crimes have come down by that percentage, could that be that actually people aren't reporting crimes, more, maybe the more minor crimes, bike theft, damage to cars, etc.? I know in, in, in Bishopton Ward there's very much a uh, a feeling of what's the point because the police are too busy to deal with my bike's been stolen or my, my property's been broken into and damaged. Uh, my concern is that where it's good that it looks like crime has come down, my concern is because of lack of, lack of faith in the police currently because you're so low on numbers and so people aren't reporting instead. Okay, in terms of just a couple of points there, and then I'll invite you in. So uh, in terms of um, going unreported, you know, I would certainly sit and encourage every member of the public to report crime because unless we know, we can't do anything about it, but also it helps us to identify trends and hotspots and patterns. Uh, and I appreciate there are some frustrations within the communities and I, and I totally understand that. And I think perhaps what's not helped local trust and confidence has perhaps been the historic difficult challenges around the one-on-one -on -one system. And that was recognised by the force because I know personally when I tried to ring in off duty, I was on the phone for, you know, 20 minutes just trying to get through to somebody. And it's really frustrating because how can we encourage people to report information or intelligence or criminality if they can't even get through to us on the phone? And that was recognised by the organisation which 
have now, um, for some time now, over the last few months, have introduced a triage service. So uh, I don't know if anybody's used the system recently, but from the feedback that I'm getting, it's far more improved. So that's the first thing. Um, so I would say, please encourage members of the public to report crime. I appreciate that not every investigation leads to an outcome, but what we are committed to do is investigate everything that's reported to us because that's our role and function. Because without knowing what's happening, we can't certainly focus our resources to the areas. And one thing that we do on a daily basis is do a crime screen. So every single day, Ben and colleagues and other people across the policing area routinely look over the last 24 hours in terms of what's happening, who may be responsible. We've got intelligence people to try and help us do predictive analysis as well in terms of where do we need to be tonight or tomorrow in terms of trying to get ahead of the curve. So it's really important to help our thinking so we can direct resources where they need to be is to have that information. Ben? Yeah, just to come in additionally on that. One of the challenges of the new Empower model that has come in is about making sure we have the appropriate number of resources in each department covering it. And that has impacted on us in terms of some of our staff at different times, in terms of movements of staff. I know particularly with a uh, safe neighbourhood team, um, and, and it's not me harking back to yesteryear, but a lot of the community come back and want to see their Bobby on the beat and the face that they know and have that trust and confidence in. And Traditionally, safer neighbourhood teams do retain their staff longer um, because it is a function that is recognises that and recognises the importance of that identity within the community and the trust and confidence that, that builds. Over the period of the last 12 months, we have been ensuring that the staff are getting back to where they should be. And I can confidently say now that I've, as of next month, it was supposed to be Monday, but the officer who is now coming into Stratford, where I've been lacking one, has uh, got a driving course, um, so needs to, needs to get that as part of it. But all of my beat managers are back in place. One of the things we're really keen on is about that community engagement piece. Um, we're significantly uh, investing as a team in Warwickshire Connected and trying to push that out to the community as well. And whilst that's an online system and doesn't fit some members of the community, um, who, who aren't perhaps so okay with that or confident with using that. It, it, it's more about trying to identify areas of our community and hear those voices. So we've also invested now in a diversity, equality and inclusion PCSO role, which is essentially, uh, uh, as, it, as it states, but it's an individual for me who goes out into the community and identifies voices who aren't necessarily heard. It's not about strands of diversity and, and independent communities, it's about anybody where actually the voices aren't being heard by Warwickshire Police enough uh, that we can engage with better and actually deliver our services and build that confidence up. The difficulty we have, and I totally understand, when you see figures, and I get crossed with figures all the time, I'm not a, 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 fa a fan of figures because data can be skewed in any way you like, to be honest with you. It's important because it guides us but it doesn't always mean what it's supposed to mean. And as you'll quite rightly say, crimes that are recorded doesn't necessarily indicate the incidents that are going on that perhaps aren't reported. And that does come down to the trust and confidence in the community to be able to report it in some way, shape or form. I'm trying to improve that. I'm trying to get those messages out there. It's also about balancing within the community, and this is where we ask for your support for as well, and lots of our other partners, in terms of manage, managing expectations. Um, and it's not that somebody's, let's say, m more minor crime or incident they've occurred isn't gonna get a service or importance, but it's about managing what, what you expect to happen from it and what we can realistically do. We might not be able to solve that particular incident that's occurred, but knowing about it means we might be able to prevent something in the future. And it's about getting those messages across to our community and helping them help each other by watching each other's back, getting that neighbourhood policing back where, you know, if I go back, I've said this before, old Pelian principles where the police are the public and the public are the police, that we're looking after each other and looking after our neighbours and happy to report things. That's last point. Yeah, I was say, so just some feedback from personal use of the 101 system recently. That is really improved. It's, it's very efficient and effective now. Um, again, community engagement, one of the areas close to my heart is the domestic abuse. And I know you've got the DART team, domestic, abu domestic abuse response team, that's you know, really, really 
um, helping and engaging and also giving training to officers as well. So I think that's really positive. Um, and again, I'm, I'm also concerned about workload. Obviously, we haven't got it in this country yet, but we've all seen the, the new um, hate crime law that's been brought in in Scotland and in the first two weeks or less than two weeks they've had 8,000 8, plus reports so um, I, I can appreciate sometimes you, you might not be able to cover all the items especially if, if politicians bring in new laws that can impact on your workload but not necessarily giving you the resources so I, I can appreciate that there might be problems as that but yeah, again um, I think the response is much better both in terms of speed and also quality of the response. In my personal, and I've had a couple of residents tell me that as well, so they've been impressed. Soon. And obviously, you only get one chance to make a first impression. And if you get that right first time, you've got that person on board. But if you don't, it, it is very difficult. So I, I'm, I'm really impressed with that. Um, Faz, have you finished with your updates? Ben, do you want to come in? Or, or we, should we go to questions? Yeah, oh, I was just going to quickly say, just, just in terms of what you're talking about there, for yourselves and for your reassurance, uh, both Faz and I, we are the, if you like, hate crime lead for the force. I sit on the County Partnership Hate Crime Board. Um, between us, we've just uh, written a new policy uh, for Warwickshire Police and procedure for hate crime. So, you know, it, I'm not saying that's because we're experts or particularly good at it, but we know about it very well because we put that in place. New legislation in terms of... Um, non-crime hate incidents and legislation around the retention of data uh, is all had to be built into that process in terms of incidents that get reported that don't actually specifically mean crimes. So we're hot to trot on that sort of subject, if you like. Likewise, with domestic violence, um, you know, a, a, a critically serious um, offence within our communities across you know, the, the country, let alone um, Stratford districts in itself. But it is our highest volume crime. And as a consequence of that, working with partners and your own community safety team, we run a, a problem solving meeting every month with multiple partners. And just last month, we had one specifically around domestic violence and better ways in the community that the local policing team and partners can influence that. Um, I know that we're looking at um, hubs within the community now so we can get better reporting. We're working with the housing associations to improve their uh, reporting processes and um, how they can support victims and potential uh, triage of um, offenders who we can put in our perpetrator programs, etc. So it's kind of better join up now with our specialist DART team, as was already mentioned by uh, the chair, um, around what we can do more locally to support that wider uh, you know, real volume incident that happens in our community. So that was just some reassurance for you. Councillor Ralph, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just two questions, a quick one to Faz. How does the triaging work on 101? The second question to Ben, are you going on to talk about antisocial behaviour? You are. Okay, so I'll wait until you've talked about that. But Faz, how does the triaging work? So uh, there's been an, a small investment of uh, a number of resources back into the control room function. So that's populated through a mixed economy of police officers and police staff. And when you ring 101, um, it goes through to our main switchboard, which filters all the calls. Uh, and as a result of the triage system now, because those officers are trained, they are now picking up that volume and signposting it and asking questions at source, where <coughs> historically, where what would happen is you'd be in a queue, you'd wait for it to ring, and somebody to deal with. Um, so they're actually able, with the skill set they've got, to be able to make a determination of where it needs to go, whether it needs to go for, a, for uh, an incident to be recorded, or they can give advice at source, or whether they need to signpost it to another agency. And that's some of the things that I certainly think have helped the current level of service that people are now experiencing. Thank you. Actually, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my uh, area is, is Orchard Hill. Um, and what I wanted to ask you is, do you look at the Trinity Mead um, Facebook pages? Because I've been asked a question is, by, by the people who use that, is will the t police take any notice if we put it on Facebook? 
because um, uh, it's a lot of minor stuff like nicking number plates and that type of thing. Do you do you look for that, or and do you do anything about it, or do you wait for an official contact by each individual? Okay. Um, the short answer is no, because we can't be governed by a social media group in terms of reporting. There are and has to be proper lines into reporting incidents into the police. One of the issues is, um, and don't get me wrong, if, if it's reported to any police officer in any way, shape or form, we should be able to take further action with that and put it through. But, as you can hopefully imagine, my local policing team, um, if, if every report, and whether it was from social media that we see or even just from a member of the public as you're walking down the street, we would be beseeched with incident recording rather than investigation or dealing with the issues themselves. So we do ask that any specific incident reported, whether it's intelligence or criminality or an incident that's occurred, does get reported through the, the systems. And, and that's where the frustrations of 101 does come in, um, which is why we do have our online reporting as well, um, which we're desperately encouraging, and other means to do that, like I've already mentioned in terms of Warwickshire Connected, which isn't for reporting, but does actually put those incidents in for us to pay attention to. That's not to say we aren't aware of what is, is shown on Facebook. Our corporate communications team are regularly reviewing and scanning the horizon in terms of social media, um, as well as the news and everything else. And so when uh, an incident is picked up with some uh, fervor in terms of social media communications, it does get picked up by us. And we do try to preemptively deal with things. So, for example, um, Chief Inspector has already mentioned that every morning we have an eight o'clock briefing where myself and some of my other colleagues review every single incident that's come in overnight. Say incident crime that's been recorded overnight. Um, and I don't go through the, the devil of the detail of each one, but I pick up the themes and anything that's particularly hard. As a consequence of that, we talk about it in that morning briefing and set our parameters and targeting for not just us, but the various different teams that govern that. On a weekly basis, I do a weekly priority overview of the week previous. And that format I can show here, which is a document, um, and there's a briefing sheet that goes out to my colleagues, goes to the boss, goes out to all the rest of the teams on things that we need to focus on, whether it's criminality and volume crime, whether it's antisocial behaviour, things and harms that are impacting on us just last week that we want to get traction on and try and stop immediately. And then as a consequence of that, um, on a, <coughs> further to that on a weekly basis, I produce a report for, for the boss uh, in terms of, and, and again this is another, another one, which is a, a deeper dive into the number of crimes specifically in Stratford and incidents that we're looking at. So we've got a current intelligence picture all the time based on the data that has been reported, some of the information that comes in from the local policing team itself, from the community itself, so we can try and target incidents of criminality and stop it before it's actually embedded. Likewise, it helps us pick up on trends that we can then put our resources to focus on. Yeah, thank you. I think, I think I've, just, I've got Councillor Keith and Keith Councillor Wally Hoggins, in there. I, I think that's just leading on something I wanted you to bring in, is that we as councillors should be helping the police as much as we can. Um, both, you know, as councillors, the council itself, officers, etc. Again, we, we should be supporting the police as much as we can because you know they've got a really difficult job, and the, the number of crimes have exploded exponentially. So, I think from your point, Councillor Fragi, perhaps. If you become aware of these issues on that Facebook page, and I appreciate that the police haven't got the resources to, to monitor all these pages, whether you could summarise those and, and, and get in touch with police, say you, you become aware of so many incidents in your ward and detail the type of incidents, and then the police would get a flavour of what was happening. Like, well, they're probably aware about it, but if we communicate that way, the police would then have a formal record from a councillor to say these are happening, rather than something on uh, our Facebook. So I think we, we can all do something to help the police as well. So um, little, little actions might lead to something um, happening that, that prevents something quite serious. So, uh, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, I've got Councillor Keith Lee and then Councillor Wally Helgens then, please.
That's on now. Thanks, Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Faz, Ben. Um, first of all, just to say my, my ward um, is Long Marston, so it's all the new housing down at the airfield in Long Marston, me on Vale, that area, um, and then back up to Clifford Chambers. So it's quite a bit of rural area, but there's also a lot of new houses and a lot of new people. Um, first of all, just to say I was really pleased to hear about the 101 improvements. So I, I think that if people start to notice that would be important. I'm just picking up what the chair said about um, helping you to work closer with the communities. One of the things that we all do as uh, ward members is that we keep in touch with our communities through our parish councils and sometimes the residents association. There's a, there's a very active residents association at me on Vale. Um, and uh, my experience of that, uh, of your involvement with those organisations, is it's quite difficult. I think that I, I very, very um, infrequently would see anyone turning up from the police to any of these meetings. Now, I know that, that, that resource is really difficult, and the, these, are, these are evenings. Um, but also, even just finding um, kind of proactive reporting of what's going on to these organisations so that it could be talked about in the evening if there was a report from the police or something, even periodically. And I find that there's a little bit of a, maybe an opportunity there to do, do more than we're, we're doing. I had a meeting the other day with a housing association representative and she'd invited police along. Um, uh, nobody turned up, but I, I mean, it probably wasn't a good use of, of time. Physical presence is one thing, but there are ways now to, to interact and communicate more effectively, perhaps. But we spend a lot of time with our parish councils, trying to interact with them and to, to, to get them to see what we're doing to support them, what their issues are, to help them with their issues. Maybe there's an opportunity here to do a little bit more in that space, um, without physical presence, but with more... Uh, shall I say, using technology or reports to, to, to feed back what's going on. Yeah, if I, well, th thank you for that. And if, if I come in and, and try and give you a little bit of reassurance from that, certainly in your area, I will say that our beat manager there is uh, PC Sid Hammond, who unfortunately has uh, been off for uh, a few months with a knee surgery. But I know that Sid keeps a very tight grip of what goes on and communication within that area. He's now back. Um, he's just uh, uh, recuperating still, but he's back. And in fact, he came back a month early because he couldn't stay away. That's the dedication of that officer. But um, on top of that, Stratford District has, I believe, 142 parishes across the district. Uh, and when I started, I made a decision, um, and, and I think it started about three or four years ago in this post, I made a decision that I will not commit myself or my team to attend every parish council meeting because it's just impossible. And if you go to one, then the other parish wants us to go to that one. So instead, because it's, as you rightly say, that engagement piece is really, really important, what we've developed is exactly what you're talking about, that every quarter we run an online team's collective um, priorities, parish priorities meeting. So all the parishes in a given area, so in, in, in yours, for example, Sid would hold that meeting with um, his PCSOs online, where the issues, a report is given to those parishes um, around what's been going on over the last three months, what the priorities are from our data, and actually what the community themselves are saying are the problems that they're suffering. What we're developing within that, and this is a, a bit of new and exciting news for you first to hear, is an actual voting process to make it, because Historically, it's been like the, well, the police over the three priorities on a quarter, the police will choose two based on the data, and the community choose one. And part of that is because those votes that come in from the community can be skewed to one particular larger turnout from one particular parish. But what we've now, with modern day technology um, and utilizing QR codes, as you've seen um, from the cards that I've given out already. Uh, we're developing a process through Warwickshire Connected where there will be a QR code to actually vote on your priorities, uh, which will go out prior to any sort of parish um, collective priorities meeting that we run and allow the community, not even those who are just attending, but wider in the community, to vote on what they consider their biggest priority and what they want us as the local policing team and wider community partners to focus on. So we'll get hopefully a better representation of what the community wants 
and we'll be able to focus our, our, our areas particularly on that. But I do hear you, in, in lots of areas we have uh, weekly or sometimes uh, monthly newsletters that go out, um, and that's put out, again, usually on the Warwickshire Connected Forum. I know our neighbourhood watches um, in many of the areas receive that. We haven't always got volunteers to support us in producing that, because obviously, um, if I'm asking my team to do it, they're not out and engaging in the community if they're sat there writing a report. But we're trying to improve that. And if that particular newsletter needs to go out on a wider basis to resident associations as well, who perhaps aren't included, we can, we can sort that out so, um, and, and, and broaden that landscape of uh, audience, if you like. But hopefully, um, if, if yourselves haven't been invited into any of the, the, the parish quarterly meetings that we have, I can make sure you are. Um, on the next occasion, and uh, that voting system, which is far more, um, well, gives far more parity in terms of what the community wants, will hopefully come forward in the next few months. Just yep. thank you very much, Ben. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that um, I mean, Sid is an exemplary example. So if you ask anybody in that area, you know, they will know and have heard of Sid. But I've got experience in another area where I was on the parish council and it was actually quite difficult to get people engaged. Um, in addition to the regular meetings, and I'm not for a minute suggesting that your officers should turn up to them, uh, you know, physical presence is not, not really required. But every year, each parish, of which only about 90 actually are active of, of the total, um, run and organise a... Um, a community assembly, and that's an annual event that they're, 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 they're obliged to, to hold. And, and even finding sometimes reports for those has been tricky, for, for, in my experience. But I hear what you say, and if we can do more to, to, to proactively engage with these organisations, and that, that's got to be good news, so thank you. Yeah, I think so, just to follow on that, uh, Ben, um, about, you mentioned about volunteers to um, would they be specials or would they have to work for the police to help produce that newsletter? Because again, we could perhaps put something out in our newsletters saying that you want somebody to help write your newsletters as well. So again. No, absolutely. We're, we're really lucky in Stratford District that we have approximately five community volunteers and the process is uh, you, if somebody's interested, they can contact us. We put them in touch with our, our, the department that, that supports that. They go through a vetting process, they get access to our systems um, and a specific or functional task to do it. So it's not becoming a, a special constable as such. It's not becoming, you can become a community volunteer for the police and become registered as that. And I'll open, you know, any, anybody who's really interested in doing that, um, we, we, we've got gaps that could be filled. And I know from recent conversations with our Neighbourhood Watch Chair for Warwickshire County, as it were, I've had contact with because there's some disparity in terms of the communications that go out to our neighbourhood watches who want to be more involved in supporting us. In some areas they get really good service as you've already mentioned in terms of our contact with it because we've got volunteers in certain areas they get a much better service so it's trying to get some more consistency not just in Stratford district but wider across the force. If you send me the details, I'm, I'm sure I can circulate it to the councillors and we can, I'm sure we'll put in our newsletters as well. So I think, again, trying to help. Yeah, fast, please. If I could just come in in terms of engagement, it's a really valid point because one of the key things that is really important for us as a service is not only trust and confidence, of us, but, but is also that police legitimacy, i.e. what are we doing? Is it legitimate? Is it ethical? And you can only really deliver that when you get to the heart of building relationships with people to help people understand, because I'm sure most people will appreciate that. Um, in the last few years, policing hasn't had the greatest of brands. You know, lots of horror stories have come out um, out of the Met, which don't you know, paint policing in a very positive light, to be honest. Uh, and we're really acute to that. So one of the things, certainly as a small force, uh, with a mixture of rural villages and towns, we've got an opportunity to have that real localised engagement. I, you know, I live in the West Midlands region, I live in Solihull, Hall, and I, don't, I can't tell you who my local policing team is, and that's not a slight on them, but I can tell you as a resident, I'm not alive to who they are, and that's just my lived experience. But certainly here, in the policing area that I work in, you know, we have a, uh, an engagement strategy that we've brought to life over the last 12 months, because um, one of our strategic aims is engagement, because it's really vital. So through that, there is a requirement on all the layers within our safe neighbourhood 
um, world, our PCSOs, our beat managers, sergeants, inspectors, and myself to have that active engagement. So some of the teams run, um, you could say, the outreach events where we do, uh, you know, couple with a copper, excuse the phrase, that's what it's called. Um, they're open at Ulster Police Station where actually anybody can drop in and see us. But what I will say, if, if there's a real burning issue within a community or, or a partner organisation, then we'd like to know because only through dialogue can we actually help to give a view of what life is really like. I recently went to the Stratford District Count, uh, Stratford District Neighbourhood Watch Association where I'd asked to come along in the queue and I'm not averse to going to any group. So if there's a need, um, we're more than happy to kind of support that process. But there is, just to give some reassurance, there is the plan that the staff have in terms of doing that really vital engagement in those communities. Great, thank you. Sarah, um, do you want to come in, please? Yeah. Hi, um, ex-police officer, West Yorkshire Police, 30 years ago, shiny buttons, no stab vests. I am never ceased to be um, uh, staggered was the only description of the policing levels that we have across well everywhere really um, and I've also just listened with interest to your comments about the investigations and so forth coming out from the Met but the Met generally is a mirror for other police forces so it would be interesting offline to find out what you've done as a res what Warwickshire have done as a result of uh, the Metropolitan police investigation findings because we all know that Warwickshire police have had their issues as well with behaviour of their officers so let us not throw those dispersions around. So my question to you is and I do want specific numbers of police officers in South Warwickshire please. Um, my patch is perhaps the most rural which is ships on Stour going down towards, well not quite Shipston, but going out towards Brails, Long Compton, Little Compton, Great Wolford. So you're looking at a blue light time of approximately 23 minutes from Stratford to the further outreaches and that's going some really without any combine harvesters in the way. So the peer report for Warwickshire, um, the last one that you had done, um, was not the best really given for police forces. There were no good or outstanding um, rates for the inspection for that. So my question to you is, having looked at all of that, and yes, mm, two years ago, however, do you have the right people with the right skills in the right place to protect the vulnerable in our neighbourhoods? And I want to know if you do have that, and also, how do you monitor the capability and effectiveness of your officers? Because I've never seen either of you two out in my patch either, let alone a police officer. So. I want to know how thinly spread you are and I want to know what you're doing to make sure that the officers that you do send out, and I had cause to meet a couple of them a couple of weeks ago uh, to do with an investigation of a crime, not my crime. So I want to know what it is that you're doing to try to pull this police force up to being good and outstanding, please. And I will be having a separate question, uh, Councillor Crump, Chair, on CCTV. Thanks very much. I'll wait with your in, uh, answers with interest and don't please do not patronize me about my old days because the peel report was very much at our mind and um there was some fabulous policing going on so nothing like warwickshire in inner city bradford let me tell you thank you okay the number of things thank you for those uh, points so in terms of uh, a couple of things that you've raised um we, we touched upon them. Yeah, you're right. A number of things that Warwickshire have done is recently every officer was revetted, so all our data was washed through the systems to make sure that we don't have any officers of that ilk. Um, and from my understanding, there was one officer that was identified which actually didn't amount to anything, so that's the first thing. We've got an internal op amethyst, so we've got a confidential reporting line and peer supporters to try and identify those officers who none of us would want in the service. That's the first point. Okay. In terms of the appeal assessment, you're absolutely right. It's not glowing. We've got HMIC currently within the organisation starting their regime again. And the areas that you um, touched upon, nine areas were looked at, eight were reported on, and every area was either, either inadequate or requiring improvement. Some of those were investigative standards, managing offenders, responding to the public. And hence, when I talked earlier about the relaunch of the policing model, the operating model was designed to make Warwickshire more effective and more efficient in what it's doing, hence why we're on this journey. So that's that. In terms of being um, more 
spread thin. We've got 100, uh, 1,115 officers in the organisation. And that headcount. I want to hear about that, that person in staff, right? Because that no. is the number yeah. that sounds, I still don't think it's enough, but I'm, I'm not bothered about how many people in the organisation so I want to know the number of people in uniform that are policing while they're sat here. This is the only piece of business we keep as staff statistics. So, how many police officers have we got deployed? Not that are, you know, not PCSOs, actual police officers that can actually arrest. Okay. okay, so if we look at Stratford, so I have 44 patrol PCs here, so each shift is made up of 11 officers here and 12 officers over at Grace, so at any one time we seek to deploy those officers. So 11 police officers and how many of those are generally on annual leave at any one given time? How, how many are allowed okay. to go off annual leave at that from there? Well, generally speaking, when we look at abstraction and we define abstraction for a number of things, yeah. one, sickness, courses, leave. So we tend to run on a 33% abstraction rate, which is recognised by the organisation. So that takes that down to, um, is that nine, eight, nine officers? No, no. For the dis so when we push all, we've got two bases, as I said earlier. We've got one at Grays, one at Stratford. So you might have nine officers here. We could have another 10 or 11 over at Grays Mallory. And it's one shift, so we have an A shift and an A, a shift for Stratford. So it's one team divided over the, t the two bases. <laughs> and outside of that, obviously... Um, we've got patrol teams across the county and based on need, we move officers across the county. So, for example, if we needed to move resources around from the north to the south, if we're having a particularly busy day, then we do that quite regularly in order to meet the demand. Thank you. It's still not going, I'm still trying to drill down here. So that nine officers then, or 11 officers, so can you just state the area that those nine officers are expected to travel between? So is that so the north of Ulster? Is that going out to uh, where Councillor Hencher Serafin's office? Is, is that going from the very north of Stratford District right the way down to the south? That's it's just nine officers covering all of yeah, that, it's for, it's it? for the, Yeah, it's for the whole district. Yeah. And are you happy with that number of officers? Am I happy with those officers? No, are you happy with them? Do you think that that is an adequate policing level given the... Um, given the area that you are trying to cover. It's not difficult. Yeah, well, I think I'd always like more resource. I think we'd all want more resource. And I can tell you we've got 17 more officers landing in May and June. So we'd always want more resource if we, if we could have more resource. Let's be very clear, those 17 officers, are these um, sort of, if you like, trainee officers, um, probationary officers? Is that, is that what these 17 officers are? For the next round, yes, because we've got a number of cohorts currently in, train, in training at... So we're getting 17 more arriving, like I said, in May and June, which obviously will complement our continued patrol officers. Got one more. Councillor Rolf Hargins, then we'll move on. I'll yeah. just, do you know what, I'll just leave it, thanks. Okay. Councillor Rolf, please, if you, do you want to come in? Uh, to are they not questions for the Police and Crime Commissioner? I mean, it's not these guys' I, I think, fault, yeah, I think... Yeah, I think we'll, think we'll move on. But I think this the point, of, point about resources, and okay. we'll, we'll make that point. So as I do well. want to talk about an ASB. An ASB, yeah. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah. A burning topic, antisocial behaviour, is a, uh, a concern in all areas, and I know it's particularly a concern vocalised quite regularly within Stratford Town as well as the wider areas. Um, I haven't got statistics for you on antisocial behaviour. What I have got, and the reason I haven't got that, is because the recording processes have recently changed. We used to record um, on a, 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 a separate system that was shared between the community safety team and other partners and the police. We've moved and evolved that now, so our incident and crime recording system, Athena, now will start recording antisocial behaviour, so we're getting some better data dialogue in terms of what incidents are taking place. Um, from Stratford District's point of view as well, I'll, I'll mention something that the force has taken on. We have now developed a role for our, within the um, PCSO remit, um, which is uh, antisocial behaviour PCSO. Now, they're essentially, they're a co coordinator function and a subject matter expert around antisocial behaviour. Uh, they're all being put on bespoke courses around how to utilise the antisocial behaviour legislation, civil powers, because it's been picked up specifically by myself to try and encourage that. I used to also have a portfolio responsibility for our harm hub, which had 
the previous civilian community harm coordinators in that role, and we weren't doing enough with it. We were using those powers but not understanding them properly. Uh, we were giving out lots of um, community protection warnings and not actually being able to see them through because we didn't, as a team, professionally recognise how we could utilise those powers more effectively. So now we've got subject matter experts on each of the S&Ts, uh, the Safer Neighbourhood teams, and ours, Don Bezgeri, who you, many of you probably know as a PCSO in the team, has taken on that role for us um, to support us with that. Um, in terms of antisocial behaviour within the town, um, the, the, the particular focus that we as the police look at is around personal antisocial behaviour and where it impacts upon individuals specifically. Um, we know that we've got some key issues and have had some key issues vocalised around young people um, in different areas of Stratford, but particularly the town centre and some of the other wards within um, the area. Uh, we've got issues with our, well, we had an issue with our street homeless, with homelessness and begging, um, that we did a specific operation, many of you might remember, called Op Recording, uh, over a period of about four weeks that challenged the antisocial and sometimes criminal behaviours of, of, of begging within Stratford Town, but on the caveat of also supporting the vulnerability and referrals to uh, agencies around substance misuse, etc. So trying to capitalise on not just uh, targeting vulnerable for behaviours that they might be involved in, but actually putting some resolution into trying to support and preventing it. It did work in terms of reducing the amount of antisocial begging that took place in Stratford Town. Unfortunately, yeah, we have pockets of it. Unfortunately, one of the considerations from that is it led to some of those individuals taking up residence as a street drinking community that we're familiar with. Um, and that is, is a, a backwash, if you like, out of moving them from locations around the town that they were antisocial begging in, now they're congregating in a, a location there. The difficulty we have within that particular cohort of individuals is a lot of what they do isn't committing any offences. It isn't antisocial. Their, their presence, their clothing, their um, behaviours, whilst might not fitting in with everyday society on a, on a general level, isn't actually committing any offences. However, their problems or issues that some of those individuals struggle with in their lives do then sometimes escalate into the, some of the antisocial behaviour and, and unfortunately sometimes criminality and that we do focus and target on. Um, the problem is we can't be there all the time which is what the public want and we can't move those individuals on without specific powers to do so and I'm not going to go into um, current antisocial behaviour bills around Vagrancy Act and, and, and things, but you know that's going through the local government, uh, not you know, national government at the moment. But the, the one important thing regarding um, dealing with these issues is about trying to problem solve rather than just either criminalise or victimise individuals. A lot of our people involved in antisocial behaviour, whether they're young people or in, in this particular cohort, I'm talking about the, the street drinking community as it were have vulnerabilities that we also have to recognize and by uh, any change in statute or law to give us powers to remove is great on one hand and, and appeases many of the community who feel disenfranchised or affected by it doesn't provide a solution for how we're going to solve that problem on a longer term basis and if there isn't the infrastructure to help either divert or help, help young people make better choices and decisions in terms of their behaviours, help vulnerable people with substance misuse problems get over those substance misuse problems, uh, and the rest of their associated history in their lives that led them to that place will never solve that problem. Uh, arresting them, fining them, putting them in prison isn't going to help because there's no money to pay for it. So we'll be back in this cycle and situation. So I'm sincerely hoping the legislation and the decisions that are going to go through the government now around vagrancy and begging and homelessness take that into account from a personal perspective. From our perspective, to deal with some of those issues, we've done a significant amount of work. We're guilty of not potentially publicising it enough, um, but part of that is because I'm not wanting to target or highlight um, persecution of vulnerable people as much as anything else. Some of it's around police tactics that we don't want to make and expose before. But we've had uh, 
back in, I think it was November, we had a month of daily patrols, for example, around um, our, our street drinkers, where we had uh, an enhanced presence of policing on a daily basis throughout the whole day in that town centre location. In terms of the young people, we hit spikes of problems that we've had around um, the disused buildings, around the Apex buildings and Windsor Street car park. And we've been tackling those issues where we've dealt with a number of youths found guilty of potential offences, working with our youth justice um, partners uh, around diversionary roles to try and actually support those youths particularly. One of the particular spikes that's been brought up is around knives. Um, and I know people are fearful, the Herald have um, publicised stuff um, a, a around concerns around young people with knives because of images on social media and TikTok um, uh, of young people carrying knives in Stratford at Stratford locations. And that is a real concern for me, particularly as the district uh, uh, policing lead for Stratford, and I know for the community. One of those things I've already passed around to you, and I'll make reference to it now, is, is, is an in initiative called Op Talkative uh, that I've come up with, and these are the posters here, that you will hopefully see around your community. But it, it, it's going to be coming across Warwickshire per se, because uh, it, it's been picked up on that. This is a prevention and diversion initiative to try and get more information coming in around people carrying knives. Now, I can tell you the statistics around knife crime because I'm also taking on a tactical role for the organisation on this. Warwickshire Police over the last year has probably recorded approximately 250 crimes relating in knife, to do with knives across the whole of Warwickshire. Young people involved in that represent 20% of that number, so 50, which is still 50 too many, and that's crimes recorded. That doesn't say anything about those who we haven't stopped and dealt with for knives, those who are carrying knives, um, that, uh, or reports that we get about somebody having a knife. So what we're doing with this is trying to get more information to come in where we can not just deal with enforcement of crimes that are recorded, but we can actually utilise diversionary processes with our partner agencies to actually, when we get information about an individual, whether an adult or a child, um, in possession of a knife or potentially in possession of a knife, which could be related to exploitation in county lines, it could be related to concerns and fears and bullying that they're having at school, it could be relating to a domestic circumstance or situation, that we can get involved earlier on before it gets to a criminal process and steer those individuals away from that knife crime basis. So op talkative is, a, is, is being promoted now specifically uh, around how we get the message out to our community, how we get uh, our community talking about it. On the cards that I've given you in the posters, there's a QR code. This one with the blue uh, surround links directly to Fearless, which is the young person's anonymous crime reporting um, system. And so we're wanting to use these around locations that young people frequent, whether it's schools. And I've got meetings with uh, various different individuals across the county for this. But there's another poster which has a, a grey background which goes to Crime Stoppers um, as well as the other normal reporting channels. So there's a lot of work is what I'm saying going on and, and I'm proud of this because it's kind of mine um, but it's a, a reflection of what we're doing in Stratford that's then echoing out across the force. We're doing a lot of work and we're not necessarily satisfying everybody because we're not able to produce the incident results. I've got a meeting next week with a number of residents at the police station regarding some of the issues of antisocial behaviour that's been picked up, um, where I'm going to tell them some of the things we've been doing and tell them what we're intending to do on it. On top of this, we've got uh, a PSPO application going through that you'll be aware of uh, in, in terms of a public space protection order for Stratford, town centre in, in, a, in a zoned particular area, and that's specifically around giving us the opportunity not to eliminate drinking or alcohol from our community areas altogether. What it does is if we recognise that individuals' behaviours are leading towards antisocial behaviour because of alcohol consumption, it gives us the powers to confiscate that alcohol, it gives us powers to remove them and ask them to leave, or indeed take action if they don't. Um, and so that will hopefully come through. It's in public cons consultation at the moment. A further measure that is coming forward in the next, uh, well, 
from, from the start of May for the next 11 months is Operation Resolve, which is a national process of funding that's coming out from the Home Office to enable all forces an ability to stand up more diligence around antisocial behaviour. Uh, Warwickshire Police have been in receipt of that and this op resolve as a consequence will show an uplift in particular key zoned hotspot areas of antisocial behaviour and any others that get identified as a consequence because we all know when we target one area sometimes those behaviours move to another so it's flexible to move but we're going to have a stand up of additional resourcing uh, with a higher volumed police presence to actually try and tackle and deal with the issues of antisocial behaviour that take place, but also reassure the community within those areas that we are there to deal with it. That's a really comprehensive one there, Ben. Thank you. I've got two more questions and then, all right, three, very briefly. Um, Ian, you sneaked in again. So oh, I've got Councillor Hanchez serving, Councillor Johnson, a light runner from Councillor Fragile, and then I'll sum up and we'll, we'll bring it to a third close. So, Peter, can I hand you the floor, please? Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your attending today. Um, my ward is Studley North, which is quite a, a large population, six and a half thousand. Um, I've actually lived there temporary for 52 years. And I've seen a lot of changes. When I arrived, we had two full time police officers. We had a full working youth club. We didn't have antisocial behaviour as such then. But as the police has dwindled, and I understand, you know, you're on demand and you can't be everywhere. And I think we as a community have a responsibility um, because there's, there is a certain group in Studley which do cause antisocial behaviour as I've noticed over the years, and um, I've, I've talked to a few of these people. And um, what I've tried to do, with the support of the parish council, is we've got a youth centre in the village which has been closed for over 15 years. It's owned by Warwickshire County Council. And I brought this issue up uh, with Warwickshire oh, two years last October. And this process has been going through. Now, the object of this process is that we take it back in control of the parish for community youth and youth club. Because this certain group of people are bored, they've got nothing to do. So what are they going to do? They're going to be doing something. So, so hopefully we can bring this back in and eliminate this antisocial behaviour in our area. I do work with the uh, CPOs um, that come to study and they're always very good. And um, one of them, Sanjay Singh, he used to be involved many years ago with, with the youth club and he quite enjoyed it. And I think he would come back and do some voluntary work. And I think we can't... Well, I know... You can't be everywhere. We haven't got enough police. But we need to work within a community and understand what is needed and keep young people occupied and interested. I think, to my mind, looking at this over all the years that I've been there, um, and I do try to talk to a lot of young people, you know, if they're just hanging around and asking them what they would like to do. They, they want an interest. They want something. And um, I think it's, it can't be just all up to the police on antisocial behaviour. I think we all have to work together. OK? Yeah, I, I think... Yeah, I, I get where you come from. I gave you some leeway, Councillor Henshaw's everything. And I think the bottom line of that is that we haven't discussed it. I think we've all got some responsibility to take and provide some form of distraction or diversion. That was the word I was looking for, not distraction. Diversion. And I think we have got to take some responsibility and it's good that um, your community is, is helping the police so I think that's a message we do need to get along I think we've got to help the police uh, and they can't be everywhere and the other point is about reporting as well uh, get the messages across um, I, I, I do believe that one of the uh, reports was to do with a loud shirt in Studley and uh, and I, I don't know where that came from but uh, um, 
So, no, they're, they're serious. I think there's, there's some good points there, and I think that the gentleman will take it on board. Um, I'm so I was just going to quickly say, just for your reassurance, I'm, I'm, I'm massively key on that. We have one of our youth engagement team who work from Ulster Police Station anyway, who would be heavily involved in that. I'm a real advocate for that and working with young people particularly. My children went to primary school in Studley and I live just around the corner, so that's not any bias towards Studley, by the way, but it, th there is an appetite. And, and, and just to, to cover it all in terms of resourcing, I can reassure you without being drawn into a conversation in terms of how I would love more resources, but what we do deliver, particularly to Stratford, is value for money, value for service, because I can tell you now, my team particularly as a local policing team, deliver way beyond their means to do. And that's not me being defensive about it, but we, we, we do a lot for what we've got uh, and deliver a lot. I want to deliver more. I've got real ambitions, hence the things that I get involved in personally but my team are all behind me on that. So if it's any reassurance to you, yes, I would love more resources. That's not a decision or a discussion I can be in, but we do give as much as we can and, and above and beyond. And if there's any shortfalls, we'll do our best to pick that up. Thank you. I'm going to say, and when your children went to school and studied, they obviously come across Councillor Henshaw Sheriff in shirt, so therefore they've prepared for any shocks in life and... Uh, you're not easily offended, so it's, it's set them up for life. Um, Councillor Johnson, please, please get us back on track. It's, uh, as much of a comment, I think, as a, a question, but I'm happy to get a response. Um, I feel reasonably well served by the Safer Neighbourhood team for Wellsville and Kyneton. We do have regular meetings, and Mr Henbury came to the annual parish meeting 12 months ago. Um, my comment really is there seems to be bit of an over-dependence on the work of the PCSOs. Um, that's the physical presence, that's the, the name we know. There may be other people behind them, but we don't see them to the same extent. Um, there was a traveller incursion in Wellsbourne last September, which seemed to be entirely dealt with by the PCSO. Um, is that common? Is that standard or is that because officers weren't available at the time? Whatever. Sure. I, I, I can't speak about individual um, cases uh, because they differ and it does come down to resourcing sometimes. What I will say is the role of the PCSO has changed and evolved significantly. They are worth their weight in gold. They are as much as I would define it, police officers at the, the responsibilities they carry other than the police powers are as much the responsibilities police officers used to have a few years ago. Um, their role has evolved as much as that. Um, I know with, with my team specifically, and certainly in, in the PCSO in your area, they are very much worth their weight in gold. What we have done to ease that, and it's not trying to put in uh, policing on the cheap or policing in, in any other terms, it's an evolution that's had to happen because our remit has become broader and broader and broader. Uh, our original remit was about just law and disorder, if you, if you go back to our origins. But actually, our, our, our role now is so much more about community harm, vulnerability, problem solving. And, and these things aren't necessarily a police-powered responsibility or role, but we take it all on. Uh, I was talking to my counterpart in the community safety team, Sam Salmensek, the other day, on the basis that his team, I, I see no difference between myself and Sam in terms of what we do. Yes, I've got police powers and I can lawfully use those powers, but actually we do exactly the same role because our role is trying to, to, to reduce that community harm and vulnerability. Now, our PCSOs, what we've done within Stratford District, and you mentioned about unlawful encampments, I have specifically devised a, a process where we try to get what you need to do in terms of my team at any particular incident mapped out specifically. So something that can be quite complex, like an unlawful encampment suddenly arriving, where some, you know, certainly to the community can be very alarming and panicking and everything else, and there's a lot of processes and procedures that we have to follow through with the local authority and in terms of our powers. But there are a set way to deal with that. So we've now got, not just in the unlawful encampments, but various different incidents that might occur, a pro forma, if you like, where any member of our team, whether they, if they are the only person on duty, 
on that day if they are just a PCSO, and I don't mean just a PCSO in a condescending factor at all, but they have the ability, the tools, the knowledge, and the ability to start that process rolling. If police powers are required, other resources get called in from that individual, but actually a lot of it can be done at any level, and it doesn't necessarily need a police officer. It can be done by one of the community safety team, and that's the model that I'm trying to promote, because actually making the best use of us all and the powers that we all have is the way that we manage and support our community. Just in relation to that encampment that you've made reference to, um, I know at the time the local piece itself was heavily involved in terms of reassurance, but I know a little bit about that incident. But in that context, our officers, police officers went out and did a site assessment because that's the first stage of that. We have a dedicated gypsy travel liaison officer, and then we have a process that sits in the background if we need to use an, um, police powers so there is a process. So in that case, officers were involved in terms of regular reassurance visits, etc. But the, I know the local pieces at the time was heavily involved in terms of providing that kind of frontline reassurance. But I can give you some reassurance that our officers and police officers were fully involved in that incident to get it to a successful resolution. Brilliant. Um, right, we've really got to wrap up in a minute now. So I've got Ian. Uh, Victoria and Malcolm, and then I'll sum up with them. So can we keep our questions as concise as possible? And if you do need a fuller answer, perhaps we can leave the details with um, the officers, uh, police officers here to them to get back to you, because I think really we've got to bring on, and I think the gentlemen are sharing signs of fatigue now. Um, I'll cheer them up with a couple of jokes in a minute, but um, I think we can move on. So Council Fragile, please, as brief as possible, but concise. Thank you, Chair. I will be brief. Um, on the first page of, of this uh, meeting, it says this meeting can also be viewed live via the SDC YouTube channel, uh, which presumably means that the public can have a look at it, or the crooks might be looking at it. Does that give you anything which might, you know, you might not want to say? at this meeting where you might have had said it if it wasn't being recorded? No, no, not in terms of, uh, of, of the, the questions that have been asked in this meeting and things that we'll be saying. We're, we're, we're not going to deliver tact police tactics in terms of what we're doing. We might not say them in a public forum in any case, in, in any way, shape or form. But actually, I've got no problem with the community knowing what we are, what we do, some of the difficulties that we face as well. Um, but actually, Hopefully it's come across to yourselves, but also to anybody watching, that there is a dedicated service to our community from Warwickshire Police in Stratford District as a whole. There, are, uh, that there is a want more than with anything else and a will within the teams that uh, Faz here um, uh, s supervises, if you like. I know from my team, from a safer neighbourhood perspective, you've got a real investment of individuals and we will deal with stuff. Um, we're trying to improve how we do it. Victim care and support is, is, is paramount to that and we don't always get it right. Uh, we have got a young workforce, uh, not by our own choosing in terms of the way the world has worked and the government has worked in terms of how we recruit officers now. But those young people who are now our new officers will learn and develop the appropriate life skills and communication skills to deal even better with members of our community, but some of us who joined in more senior years um, have learnt and, and may have possessed from other walks of life before. But you've got that reassurance, and I, I don't mind telling any member of the community, we will support you and deal with you. And if you're breaking the law and doing things that you shouldn't, we will find you and we will deal with you. You could say you got to the crooks of the matter there, Ian, couldn't you? Uh, moving swiftly on, um, Victoria, please, do you want to come in? Thank you, Chair. Um, I will say, you know, I do think you do an excellent job considering you are shamefully underfunded. Um, it's interesting your comments about um, antisocial behaviour that might not be antisocial behaviour, especially in the centre of Stratford. Um, what I will say is, I thank you for what you said explaining that. My concern is residents are rapidly running out of patience. And that is, in my mind, slightly more concerning than what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. It's what could end up it resulting in, because people are running out of patience with the situation. There are many different... 
forms of antisocial behaviour, and I think the difficulty is, is it antisocial behaviour, is it a criminal act, or is it just an irritation to people? Um, I know it's been raised to me and other councils as well, e-scooters, we know they're supposed to be illegal, but they seem to be more and more out on the, on, on the roads in Stratford and in neighbouring wards. I know, I know in my ward and also my neighbouring ward, Hathaway, that there has been incidents of issues with e-scooters. So I'd hope that would be something that, that will be action. Though quite how you catch them, I do not know, because they are very fast and you can't really chase down a 14-year-old on an e-scooter in a squad car. <laughs> That's why it, get, it can get dangerous for them. Are there still work going on regarding county lines and drugs in the area? It is something that has been targeted very much in my ward of Bishopton and again Hathaway um, and Avenue as well, actually, because the three of them will link in. Lorraine's nodding ahead at the and back. Hiddington. And Hiddington. Um, but it's not something that hasn't come up in today's, in, in today's presentations. Thank you. Okay. See, I kept it short. Ish. Ish. That's good for, good for you. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. Um, just in response to that, I'm just conscious of the previous comment in terms of being recorded and you don't know who's watching. So um, we have done a number of operations, a number of warrants. Uh, earlier in March, we had a county lines intensification week. We do have a dedicated serious and organised crime team who regularly police the town. The local neighbour policing team actively look developed to develop intelligence and execute warrants. So we are alive to it. So uh, I don't want to go into any more detail because there is work that is ongoing, which I don't want to compromise. Yep, brilliant for that. Um, Councillor Littlewood, you've got the pleasure of the last question. Thank you, Chair. I'm happy to take my question offline with the officers later. Yep, no, that's brilliant. OK, I'll, I'll briefly sum up. It's been going on a good while now. Um, certainly, I think... Um, Thank you for coming today. There's lots of things that have come out. I think, the, again, the big message is communication, uh, get the message out, and hopefully the, the people, the, the thousands of people who are watching on YouTube today will uh, see, um, they see the, the things are happening. Uh, I'm particularly impressed with the 10 system that really has improved beyond recognition. It's helpful. I think the message we do need to get out that report, report, report. Um, communicate as well. I think we as a council have got a role to play both as councillors uh, assisting you where we can, getting community intelligence a bit from Facebook, be it from somebody down the pub when they're speaking to Peter in his nice shirt there, or also dealing with, with members of the public. So I think we can help as well. Obviously officers doing a great job. You mentioned Sam and his team um, and also the role of the CCTV. And again, I think we've got a role of making sure the CCTV is the right quality in the right place and, and done based on evidence, not just on anecdotal evidence. Let's, let's have proper reasons for putting the CCTV in the right place and get, you know, so I think that's in, important. I think we've got a role to play where we can help you get people to produce your community newsletters. Because, again, that, that's good. And, again, if we can get willing volunteers, it, it saves you. So, again, we, we can do that. So I think that's been really helpful. Um, lots of useful information. And, again, I think if, if, if councillors have got additional questions, we, we can take them offline as well. So it's uh, been really helpful. Thank you for coming. Uh, doing a great job as usual. And thank you for laughing at my puns. Like I say, yeah, they're almost bordering on the criminal. So thank you for that, gentlemen. And uh, have a safe journey back. And... Uh, um, Keep on peeled, as they used to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the invite. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Members, would you like, a, whilst we're clearing the room, would like a five minutes? We've got to start by half past 11 at the latest. So if you're not back, I'll excuse you from the meeting.
Right then, can we um, get started again now, please? I did say 11.30-ish. Yeah. I was giving the allowances for Councillor Orcock because um, I, I could just make sure you're okay. I didn't want you to rush back and with your uh, crutch there, so, so you didn't fall over. There we are. Right then, thank you very much for that. That was, uh, I think that was a really positive meeting. Howard's got loads of notes and that we can uh, discuss at uh, Cabinet on Monday. Uh, some very pertinent points and I think we've got to, you know, we have got some responsibility to try and help the police as much as they can. Um, and especially boost, sometimes we've got access to community intelligence that they haven't. So I think we have got a role to play in that. Uh, right, next item on the agenda is the Cabinet meeting on Monday, um, 15th of April. Um, one of the main things we were going to talk about was the process for the allocation of strategic SIL receipts. Um, SIL receipts and allocation has, has been to this committee a couple of times, quite rightly, uh, and uh, we, we discussed those as well. Um, hopefully members have read the, the report. Um, which I think is, is, is on the whole pretty positive um, and I know that uh, Councillor Keithy obviously you've raised this in the past before about the way we were doing the things I just wondered whether you wanted to come in um, just give it what your views on this because I, I think I think we're probably all singing from the same page on this so well on, only just to say um, thank you chair only just to say I thought that was very well written and um, I was very pleased with the move towards an evidence-based process for looking at uh, the allocation of SIL um, so I have no I have no issues with it at all I was very pleased with it to be honest it looks like a very good piece of work um, so thanks to the officers involved Brilliant. thank you uh, councillor Wally Huggins please yeah, I replicate um, Councillor Keithley's sentiments on this piece of work as well. After um, some uh, an unedifying previous report regarding SIL to this committee, I think this is very welcome indeed. And um, it shows an area of robustness. And uh, I think uh, I'd like to pay tribute to those officers that have been involved in bringing this report um, to the fore. I know there's perhaps somebody listening in right now that's, that's done so. So thank you. Um, we again you know it's a question of working um smarter not harder sometimes and i'm 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 actually relieved to see this thank you brilliant any other questions i've got one more point i'd like to bring up and again it's it's for information um before i anybody else want to come in before i do no um yeah one of the recommendations i think it was a recommendation for the annual cycle of cell allocations for one year reports, um, basically to accrue more receipts um, before the implementation of the new process. Again, I know it might be presumptuous, but have we got any organisations or partners that we were working with who would have been potentially expecting some money from the process? And would they be disadvantaged by this suspension of the allocation? That, again, it's only for a question. They might not be. I just wondered, Mr. Perks, could you come in on that one for me, please? Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, the previous scheme relied on sort of an annual sort of call for projects. So being as like there hasn't been a call for project, we satisfied in the last allocation all the ones that were sort of outstanding that the members allocated sort of funds to. So I don't think there's anybody who is realistically expecting money. There may have been people thinking they would bid, but there, there's nobody with, with any commitment. So I, I don't see that being a huge problem. And, and again, just again, playing slight devil's advocate there. And again, we've talked about evidence-based, uh, etc. Um, again, one of the options, I believe, is, is trying to get, uh, I can't think of a better phrase, and I apologise, more bang for our buck um, w with the way we use um, meeting more people's needs and, and trying to get best value. Best value, that's a better phrase than bang for a buck. I do apologise. Um, so, again, do you think this will help us meet that aim? 
Yes, the, the steer we've had in preparing the report is to try and sort of take a sort of more holistic um, view of how we're using our SIL funds to make sure that we're delivering as much as we can of the infrastructure that's required to support the development. And by sort of broadening out its scope and looking at it sort of at a wider level, we, we think that should deliver that more effectively and give the better value that you're, you're seeking. Just one more. Oh, can some rice. Well done. You save me, then I'll come in again. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just a couple of things, actually. Um, I was looking at 1.8.1, um, uh, that the uh, South Warwickshire Community Hospital Diagnostic Centre was uh, forward funded um, this year to the tune of £1 million. And I'm just wondering, in, 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 in the light of um, what's already been said in terms of uh, holding uh, the uh, SIL payments uh, over for a, for a year. What happens if the diagnostic centre goes over budget? Are we um, obliged to fund that out of future uh, SIL receipts? Um, and a second question, maybe I, I could throw in at this point, but slightly, a slightly different question. It's, it's interesting um, wording, I think, that uh, the new process represents, and this is 1.7.1, .1, new process would represent a significant change to the current process, um, but it retains public participation and scrutiny by aligning it more with the uh, South Warwickshire local plan preparation and implementation. And I just wondered how that would work in practice. If you're happy, Chairman, I'll take the first question. I'll perhaps ask um, Jo to give some thought to the second question because she's more involved in the sort of technical detail of the report than I am. In terms of the commitment that we've given to the hospital, we're not fully funding that project. We are one of a, a part funder of it, and we've committed a fixed amount of money. So cost overrun risk sits with the NHS. Um, so I suppose potentially it could come back to us with a further bid, but that would be, have to be considered along, alongside all other bids that came in at the time. So we've no commitment beyond the one that we've already given sort of on, on the hospital. That, that risk isn't sat with us. And perhaps, Joe, if you could pick up the council the second point. Sure, yes, thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, so as part of the process for preparing the South Warwickshire local plan, uh, we will be producing an infrastructure delivery plan which is a requirement for new local plans. Um, the our existing core strategy has one as well. Um, and as part of that, there will be numerous rounds of public and stakeholder engagement um, through the plan making process and ultimately independently examined, um, including the evidence in relation to infrastructure needs um, and the kind of impact on, on um, the new development identified within the South Warwickshire local plan. So that's where that kind of public participation and kind of scrutiny occurs in relation to our new um, proposed approach, um, because it would look at things like the need, the impact in relation to any growth on, on the types of infrastructure um, and the location of where they should be provided. It also would include information on um, delivery agencies, kind of the timescales for the delivery of the infrastructure so that we can get the infrastructure in at the right time costs and how um, the infrastructure is going to be funded because as I'm sure members are aware still generally only contributes a portion of the fund so like Tony said with the hospital scheme we're not fully funding that project we're part funding that project and generally big schemes in particular are funded from a number of sources so the infrastructure delivery plan would explore that and look to, and work with kind of our delivery partners to see and have more certainty of over how these different pieces of strategic infrastructure could um, and would be delivered. And so that's where the, the element of kind of scrutiny engagement comes in, um, as opposed to the existing system, of, um, which Tony talked about in terms of the, the, bid, the bidding round. Um, so it's a, diff it's a different level of kind of, um, it's a different approach and therefore it's a different kind of type of scrutiny engagement. But, but we feel that the, the proposed approach aligning it much more to the South Warwickshire local plan um, allows a much more strategic, proactive approach and that kind of engagement in relation to where the growth is going to go. So it's more, the engagement is more aligned to the impact and, and the need um, coming through the, the development kind of strategy, if that helps. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense to me. 
Brilliant. That's great. Thank you, Councillor Rush. Uh, Councillor Passingham, then Councillor Littlewood, please. Yeah, um, yeah, it does seem a, a lot more logical way of, of allocating the money. Uh, but is there, uh, I mean, at the moment, with all the, the new house building, I'm talking about ships in particular, um, the uh, infrastructure hasn't caught up and there's all sorts of delays. And lots of the houses have been built for six, seven years now. And uh, isn't there still going to be the same sort of problem in that the sill money comes in afterwards, so we've got a delay in, in terms of the infrastructure, and really the infrastructure should be there near the beginning of developments rather than uh, you know, uh, five, ten years afterwards. I'll, I'll bring Mr. Burton on that one. Thank you. Uh, Yes, I, I don't think the changes will solve that problem. The way that nationally we're providing infrastructure through civil and section 106 money um, is largely predicated on the development generating value that it can pass on to pay for infrastructure. Now, I know that's something that the current administration would like to see changed, but it will probably require, well, whilst there are some things we can do at local level, it will probably change, require changes at national level to, to achieve that. Although the moves to the um, infrastructure delivery plan that we're doing through the South Warwickshire Local Plan will give us a clearer view of what we could potentially forward fund. So I think this will help, but I wouldn't like to sort of suggest that all ills will be cured by, by this work, but at least we're, I think, heading in the right direction by, by the moves we're making. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Mr Perks. Um, Councillor Littlewood, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, this question is more of a point of clarification uh, around 1.8. Um, uh, this committee has spent uh, quite a considerable time talking about this subject of the hospital in Shipston uh, for some time. Now, I was under the impression that things have changed, um, certainly from the feedback that we had from um, the representatives from the, um, the whichever umbrella organisation it is within the NHS that's responsible for that project. Um, the, my question really is around um, if the original um, purpose for which the SIL funding was granted changes, how does that affect our responsibility to support that? Because I understand it, the centre itself will not be providing now what it was originally intended to do. Thank you. Which one's that? Yeah, please, or... Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll have a go. Um, it's, it, it, I'm, I'm trying not to sort of avoid answering your question, but I'm going to have to to a point. It's one of those that I think is determined by the situations of the bid um, and, and what you're funding. Um, broadly, um, um, the infrastructure delivery plan, I think, will inform this better. Currently, we have sort of a, a scheme of bids, a, a bid came in for sort of healthcare provision in Shipston, which broadly is something we would support through cell. Now, the way that that is provided is determined by the ICB and the NHS rather than the council. So they're still spending the money on healthcare in Shipston, but they've chosen to sort of allocate in a different way. And there's a whole process through the ICB that sort of is checking whether, whether or not that's appropriate. And there's a public consultation to be done. And I don't think I really want to sort of be drawn into adequate provision of healthcare. So there is... Partly, when we when we pass SIL funding over to delivery agencies to meet an identified need, we're in their hands as the experts as to how to deliver that. So whilst we have some control, we don't have complete control there. I think with the inf um, infrastructure delivery plan proposal that we're moving to, the, the various bodies will need to set out more clearly what they are trying to achieve. It'll probably be at a slightly higher, less detailed level, but we would be able to then sort of ensure that the SIL money is... Um, committed to delivering those objectives more clearly so i think it will improve things but it won't give us precise control to exactly how projects are delivered uh, thank you um, that's that's a reasonable answer but i i as this money is well, in this case very considerable there could be could fund a lot of other more directly appropriate um um, projects which uh, remain the same from the introduction to the pro uh, of the idea of the project, the bid for the money, and I, I find it strange that public money is being said, well, uh, being continued to be granted for something which um, 
may or may not be a, 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 a required. Uh, I mean, if we haven't got a diagnostic centre and the money was provided for our diagnostic centre, then why are we still pro providing it? And I think, I think, I take your point, the new system <coughs> should, should uh, take account of that. But I would like to see that tightened up considerably so that, it, you know, and, and make it clear that this is what it's for. If you don't use it for that, you don't get it. Yeah, I think, so. I think I think we're obviously going into a little bit of detail here, and I, I agree. It was, a, it was. I think we put Mr. Perks on the spot, and it was a. Yeah, um, and I, I think Jay might be coming in on the same length that we we whether we need to all go away and augment our response to that question and come back to to members with that without uh, putting everyone on the spot. But Jay might have the answer straight at her fingertips. Sorry, Joe, I'm putting you on the spot there. No, I, can't, I can't promise that, Chair. But um, in terms of the all of the existing allocations, so I think we've done 18 existing allocations at the, under the current system, including the Diagnostic Centre at the hospital. They're based on a set of criteria that were applied in order to prioritise all the bids that came in. Um, and also that included on the basis of time scales for when the project would be delivered. Now, obviously, if and I don't know, but if this, you know, if there's a suggestion and, 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 and that the scheme that has been proposed now is significantly different from the, the, on the basis on which the bid was approved, and that therefore doesn't meet the criteria in in, in that it was prioritised previously, it may not now be a priority scheme, or the delivery time scales have changed so significantly that it wouldn't now be appropriate to fund that and there is a precedent for that because we did have a um we did have some funding for the environment agency a couple of three years ago they were allocated some funds for flood defense work so ulster and because of various situations they could no longer they, they couldn't get the rest of the funding um there were various different issues um and so the council took the decision i think it was a cabinet decision to actually uh, withdraw that offer of funding and that money, I think it was £200,000 for memory, that money went back into the general pot, pot to be reallocated for other projects. So if, you know, obviously this £1 million was funded in the existing process, if if there's felt that there's there's been significant changes to the proposed scheme that mean that it wouldn't now meet the criteria on which it was allocated, that there is scope to kind of relook at that and if necessary, and it would be, I think, a cabinet decision to actually say, well, we're no longer going to fund that project because of X, Y, and Z. But it would be need to be significant enough to mean that it didn't, it no longer met those criteria. If that helps. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. I think what we're looking for is just some form of um, assurity around, you know, we're still meeting its meeting its original intentions because it's a significant amount. Um, from the sounds of it, it would have to. You know, reach a relatively high threshold to, to go through that and, and, and change its original purpose. But whether we could just have something come back um, for the next meeting, just uh, provide some reassurance to us that you know we are relatively happy about this, and, and just put something in in writing to say these are the, the principles that we work to, uh, and they would have to breach all these conditions. You know, before we we said can we have our money back or we will withdraw funding so i think i think that's what we're looking for reassurance there and, and from the sense that i don't think it has but i think if we have something back in yeah just uh, something very brief as well specifically on the ships and hospital yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. and then the, and then the underlying principles could apply for, for yeah. other examples as well uh, and whilst you're on on joe i've got a very brief question on 1.65 the planning and advisory officer group and you said about working with partners so one it would be some good idea to let us know what um, the makeup of that group is and secondly we've talked about South Warwickshire local plan and working together um, would there be some for, there would definitely obviously the overlap but would there be any duplication that's what uh, my concern I, I can't see any reason why there would be but again I think the question needs to be asked as well um, yes, thanks, Chair. Um, I'll take the second point first. I think um, actually rather than being duplication, it, it, I think it, it can actually work together quite well and align kind of um, our infrastructure requirements 
um, better with the emerging local plan and obviously working with our colleagues at Warwick District as well um, to identify the priority needs across South Warwickshire as a whole. So I, I don't see um, any risk in kind of duplication. Um, in terms of the makeup of the group, um, I mean, that's, I think, still to be kind of exactly bottomed out. Obviously, if we get the approval at Cabinet, if the approval goes through at Cabinet on Monday, we'll then obviously be looking at exploring how that would be set up. But yeah, I think 1.65 does talk about, you know, possibly including County Council colleagues who obviously are big infrastructure providers um, across the district, um, whether we would want to extend it to other um, external infrastructure providers as well. I think that's kind of um, to be kind of uh, bottomed out and, and, and concluded, really. No, that's, thank you. That's, that, that's helpful. Again, I, I, it's probably the answer I was expecting, but I'd like to tease that out and get it in, in the public domain, so I think that's fair. Any other questions on this subject? Or can Joe disappear and uh, get away from us councillors asking strange questions? I think it's... Yes, you can, Joe. So thank you very much. Um, for, for turning up, answering the questions. And I think you've got away quite like this morning. So um, quick, I think quick while you're ahead is, is the, the, the phrase. So thank you very much. Also, obviously we've got the cabinet agenda with us in front of us. Have we got any other questions that members want me or Councillor Passingham to put forward at um, the cabinet on Monday? Or do I make some up when I'm there, like I normally do? Oh, I think, yes, that's tacit approval then. Nobody said no, so uh, thank you for that. Um, no, that's, that's, we've got through that one quite quickly. But I think we needed to talk about the sill, and I think it's, uh, from over Scrutiny's point of view, it's more robust. It's, it should hopefully provide us best or better value uh, and uh, make sure you know we're doing what we say we're going to do. And also, we're getting some clarification around about the principles of if a provider doesn't do what they say they're going to do, about the, if the likelihood of withdrawing funding and what we'd have to go through to do that as well. So I think that's quite good. Are you happy about how we did I sum up that most of that? What we're going to do on that one? Good stuff. I'll bring out that one as well. Um, Right, the next item on the agenda is the update on task and finish groups. So I will bring in Councillor Wally Hoggins on the housing associations, and then we've got the, the, the double team of Councillor Littlewood and Councillor Johnson on, on public houses. So if I start with Councillor Wally Hoggins and then bring in the, the dynamic duo afterwards. Thanks, Chair. Um, so the Housing Association Working Group has, has, has almost concluded now. Uh, we have got ourselves and it's been a really it's been some really hard work done on this by, by all of us involved with passion and total commitment to the residents to all of the residents in, in Stratford as well um, we are now at the point where we have a set of um, service standards that we want um, housing associations to adhere to at the moment however there is just a little bit of um, not push back it's almost we need to find out how we're going to um, articulate or communicate these uh, wishes and desires that we that we've come up with to the housing associations it's not rocket science it's things like one of the housing associations takes a picture of the fault that they're going to address then when they fix that fault they take another picture to demonstrate that it's fixed how fantastic is that you've got a record of the fault and a record that it's been fixed properly. However, some of the housing associations who use contractors um, don't have that taking of photographs written into their current contracts, and it's how we articulate that to them. So I thought it better to not bring the piece of work uh, oh, quite over the finish line until we've got to the bottom of how we... Uh, how we um, move forward with that because I think that was uh, for all of us that was such a light bulb moment really um, evidence is is key here so I'll just read out the following um, we um, the proposals that we're going to put forward six so put 
put mechanisms in place to monitor the performance of housing associations and work collaboratively with them to improve their services within the district. Although housing associations are clearly intent on improving and providing the best service possible to residents, the council and particular councillors themselves, we feel, are in a position to assist housing associations by acting as a critical friend and by representing residents' views and concerns. And therefore, one of the recommendations is that we set up a committee or um, a working group permanently staffed by uh, by, by members that meets at least twice a year, I would have said on a quarterly basis myself, to meet with representatives from housing associations to receive performance data and report back to the overview and scrutiny committee. Because I think what's come out of this is we've worked quite hard, we've worked very hard on this, and uh, we need to keep feet firmly pressed to the flames, really, and that we don't want to have to be in a position of reviewing any matters in another three, four years, that this is an ongoing and important piece of work um, that, we need, that, we, that we need to do. Um, but the most important thing at the moment is how we communicate um, to the housing associations what our proposals for the service standards agreements should be. So that's why we're not quite over the line yet, but it's better to be absolutely nailed on before we do that but that is just giving everybody a heads up that I think this is going to be a further committee that, that, that meets ongoing for the good of the residents really and bringing to the fore any other initiatives um, that, that come forward and I, and I think you know I'd just like to place on record my continued thanks to all members of this working group it's been quite exhausting and the amount of paper that we've looked through and also quite emotional listening to some of the stories and of course in perpetuity is uh, my thanks to uh, Officer Howard here, who's just been amazing. All right, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, I was, I was going to add my thanks to, to Howard as well. Yeah, really good job. Yeah. Herding cats, I think the phrase is. Um, obviously, there's, there's at least six of us here on this on this group, um, and we've we've got the scars to prove it. Um, but I think it's 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 been a challenging process, but it's definitely well worthwhile. We've teased out lots of information and the questions we've asked of the housing associations, uh, I think they've been excellent um, and, and things are coming out and we have been flexible. So well done for keeping us under control along with uh, Howard here. Um, so no, it has been challenging um, and you know, it's, 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 I think it's probably one of the best task and finish groups we've had for a while. So. Not that I'm on the pubs one, so I don't know that one. So, uh, so that leaves me smooth, <laughs> seamlessly onto the uh, task and finish groups um, regarding public houses. And uh, Councillor Littlewood and Councillor Johnston have, have got that mantle between them. Councillor Littlewood is giving the feedback on this occasion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, David. Uh, yes, um, just to remind um, members, the. Um, the, the objectives for all this was uh, to protect and preserve public houses, especially with regard to change of use within the district, and to develop uh, uh, policies, processes um, to facilitate um, their preservation um, and to reduce the number of public houses closing. Uh, the basis of that is that uh, uh, public houses, particularly in rural communi communities, but not exclusively, are... Uh, assets of community value and they are centres for um, fr from a society point of view as much as anything else um, although as we've heard earlier they can be a problem as well but there we are um, we've taken a lot of uh, information in um, the draft um, uh, report uh, has now uh, uh, in the process of being uh, checked and uh, the, at the last meeting members considered the terms of reference for the group and, um, uh, uh, and, and, and subject to final agreement um, uh, of, of the draft advice note the work has been completed to that point um, the uh, draft agreement um, will be reviewed at the next meeting which is on the 26th uh, and assuming that we agree uh, to uh, on it as it, it stands, then that will be passed forward uh, to uh, the portfolio holder uh, by the end of April of this year. 
Um, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to say that um, you know, the, the, the work that's been done has been quite uh, extensive. Uh, it's been very, very well supported by, by officers and thanks to officers. Um, however, uh, though in addition to that work, and, and, and through our discussions and deliberations, um, the, the group felt that um, the work being done now is within the context of the existing core strategy. Uh, this, of course, has got a limited lifetime. Um, it is actually constrained in certain ways, particularly around uh, validity um, uh, and viability uh, of the, uh, the, the marketing uh, reports from those wishing to change purpose um, and we would like to uh, put forward that this should be considered as, as, a, as a, a specific item under the core strategy and that uh, a, a modified version of the submission the draft um, uh, um, guidance uh, should be uh, should be written in addition to that, it was, I believe, and I will be corrected if I'm wrong, but it was uh, the group believed that pubs are only one aspect of uh, community assets that are very important, and we should consider such things as um, village stores and um, post offices, for example, which can be a very, very, very much a lifeline to both um, uh, the elderly. Uh, the young, but also, uh, particularly with post offices, it's, a, it's a, 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 an asset for local businesses which have devolved out into the community, working from home, etc., in terms of banking, etc. So um, that is where we are at the moment. Thank you. Brilliant. Anything else to add on that? Uh, Councillor Wally Huggins, can you turn your microphone? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Councillor Johnson. just had that um, the planning guidance practice note um, is, is being produced and should be finalised by the end of April um, for signing off by the uh, cabinet member, the chief officer. Okay. Thank you for that. Right, next item on the agenda is minutes from the climate change panel uh, meeting of the 5th of March. Um, any comments on that? I, I was there for most of the meeting, but I had to disappear because I was going to a, uh, a consultation meeting on the fire at uh, Shipston, I think, that day. It might have been Shipston, it was one of them. Councillor Ice, please. And Councillor Roth, yep. Yes, um, I, reading through the report, uh, I note that there's going to be a great big green week in 2024. Um, and the notes say that uh, it marks five years since the council declared a climate emergency. And I just wondered what has been achieved in that time. I note that there's a climate action, a climate change, sorry, action plan. And I just wondered um, what that will be achieving in the next 12 months and how will that be measured? Um, and actually, if I can add, while I've got the, uh, the floor, um, I note that uh, amongst the 17 items uh, that are matters arising with this panel, that there have been 27 applications, I think, yes, 27 expressions of interest in the Climate Change Community Fund, which I believe is worth half a million pounds. Um, my understanding is that there is considerably more than that available uh, in reserve for uh, this kind of activity, this kind of work. And I just wonder what's happening with the rest of the money. Thank I've, you. I've, I've kept hold of it, Councillor Rice, <laughs> for safekeeping. Um, Mr. Perks will come in, and yeah, no, I've got something to add on to that one as well. Thank you. Yeah, in terms of um, the first part of your question, if um, the committee wants to update on where we are with the sort of climate change expenditure and what we've done, I, I think it would be better. It would do better service to that by our officers to put something together for you um, as, as a paper, which we can consider as a committee rather than me trying to do it on the hoof now. Um, in terms of the community climate change fund, um, the, the the cabinet, as, as I recall, and I'm doing this off the top of my head have allocated an initial £100,000 towards community um, projects, which we've now received expressions of interest for. 
and I think we're due to analyse the bids that are coming within the next couple of weeks. Um, it's within, there is an overall fund allocated for environmental improvement works that was enhanced in the, in the last budget. Um, and it's within the Cabinet's gift to put more of that to the Community Climate Change Fund if they want to, or similarly, they, they're using that to fund other environmental projects. I know they've got um, my officer working on sort of a lot of solar array projects on leisure centres, um, general sort of carbon reduction, some improvements to this building. So generally sort of improving carbon reduction in our fleet. We've also used it to fund sort of research projects some of which have informed the South Warwickshire local plan with a view to bringing in environmental policies. So it's quite a, a sort of a broad church of, of spend in that. Um, I think there was quite a lot of debate amongst the Cabinet about what's to sort of put in the community um, climate change fund allocation initially. And they, I, th I think part of the thinking in the end was to put sort of 100,000 out there, see what sort of bids we got. Um, we're very keen to make sure that the money gets spent on preserving and reducing carbon and actually sort of making a difference. Cabinet were very keen on that. So we, we thought we'd sort of do it as a bit of a trial. If this takes a lot of carbon out of the, the atmosphere, we, we, we may be able to go out with a sort of a, a bigger sum of money. But it's at the moment we're at the, on the cusp of appraising the first projects to see how successful that scheme is. So there, there may be more to follow. Thank you for that. Young said anything I'll agree with some of the points you raised, uh, Councillor Issa Ray. Time scales and measures um, about these, you know, perhaps like some of these ones need to be a little bit more smarter, more spe specific to make sure, you know, we've got these guidelines when they're going to be achieved by measures of success. That was the phrase I was looking for. Uh, so, again, in, in principle, I've, I've got no reasons with them, but I need to be just smartened up a bit and then give some time scales. Uh, and again, hopefully that should come out of the climate change strategy. And again, over the coming months, that's again slightly non-specific as an ex-officer myself. I, you're giving yourself a little bit more leeway. Um, but sometimes we do need to be a bit more precise in our language, I think, as well. So I've, I'm, I've, in principle, lots of things I agree with. Perhaps need to be tightening them up and things so we've got something to measure ourselves on and for us to scrutinise for the reasons why they haven't met their targets or the timescales as well. So, but apart from that, I've got a problem. I've got Councillor Rolf, Councillor Wally Huggins, then Councillor Passagher. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, there's an awful lot of ongoings and to be confirmed and et cetera, et cetera. Can I ask that we bring this to ONS, please? Um, I would quite like to scrutinise the climate change panel on a lot of these issues. I'd quite like to know what's going on. I'd quite like to know how our money is being spent, where it's being spent. If that's possible, I would really like that to happen. Yeah, I, I think you've just added on to what I was just saying about smart, scrutinised timescales. So, so I, I, I think it's a reasonable request. So there's two of us agreeing with that, and I think... The majority of the, the community are uh, happy with that. So do you want to add something to the work programme to scrutinise the climate change experts in the council? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Scrutinise the climate change panel is probably not going to get you where you want. That's an advisory panel. It's more. Yeah. It's a broader well, thing, isn't it? Those, sorry. sorry, Chair. Obviously, those on the committee, um, perhaps the Chair and the uh, Vice Chair, need to come along and just be questioned, if that's possible, in the officer. If we can, uh, I, I just want to know a bit more what's happening, if that's all I, right. Without wishing to sort of prolong this and sort of be pedantic, um, I think you would need the portfolio holder for climate change there as the decision maker as well as, because the climate change panel is really a discussion forum to sort of inform sort of policy. I think you would probably want the, the officer, the portfolio holder and the, the climate change panel. Uh, Chair, thank you. Yeah. Can I tell you for that? Just to say, the portfolio holder for climate change is the chair of the climate change panel, so it's Councillor Junid. Um, and just to say, perhaps, to be concise, we could make that one item, so Councillor Rice's request that we have a general update on the action plan. Um, so we speak about the action plan and how the climate change, because the climate change panel is the body that monitors that on a regular basis. So if we do a sort of an annual review here, and then um, can look at how the climate change panel is supposed to monitor it going forward as well, so it doesn't have to keep coming to OSC sort of every month or quarter or something. Brilliant. I've got Councillor Wally Hoggins, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I was supposed to declare an interest on this. It's been a multiple times I've said this, that my husband 
um, who's a managing director of a fuel company, and I'm telling you that, in, and you've heard those statements before, um, I need to go to item 580 on, the, uh, on page 12 of our documentation, please. And uh, clearly there was the HVO fuel accreditation scheme was scrutinised by um, the panel. Um, however, I would like to raise uh, grave concerns about the following wording that is used to report. And I suspect that these are the words that were used, and that is the following. The supplier which the council intends to use, uh, this is talking about the use of palm oil, um, con the supplier which the council intends to use did not support the use of palm oil. However, that still gives us no guarantee that palm oil would not be used to make the HVO that is going to be used in our trucks. By merely not supporting the use of it is no guarantee that it isn't contained in the HVO that we will be using. And so therefore, my question is, will we be doing odd tank dipping and sending them off to find out if this um, fuel is in fact using palm oil on a fairly regular basis? Because let me be under no doubt here, this is not saying we don't use palm oil in our HVO. It is saying we do not support the use of palm oil. There's nothing here that is giving us any guarantees or them telling us how they can guarantee that palm oil is not in the HVO that is going to be used. Thank you. Perks. Yeah, um, to be, to be, thank you, Councillor Wallach. Uh -huh. There is no intention to dip the fuel to check for sort of palm oil or analyse it in any way. That's not an area in which we're expert. The proposal which we put to the climate change panel, would the, the Cabinet and ultimately Council sort of sanctioned the use of HVO within our waste fleet as a way of reducing our CO2 emissions because they're the largest CO2 emitter within our sort of Council operations by, by some margin. So it's an area that we need to tackle. Um, the only practical alternative available for early adoption is, is HVO. That was debated and we were sort of asked to take that forward. Um, as part of that, concerns were raised about sort of the fuel and the source of the fuel. And we were asked to come up with a proposal to present to the climate change panel as to how we would ensure that fuel was properly certified. And the proposal was, um, looking at the minutes, that we would um, use fuel certified under the sort of RTFO, the Renewable Transport Fuel Obligation. I must confess I'm not a complete expert on that, but this is an independent certification scheme that shows that the fuel has come from reliable sources. And um, again, I'm on the edge of my expertise. You may know more than me about this, Councillor Wally Huggins, but I assume the use of palm oil, particularly virgin palm oil, would be covered as part of that assessment. So our commitment was not to sort of test fuel to sort of work out exactly what was in it, but the proposal we put, which was a practical way of addressing this, was to ensure that the fuel was certified as complying with this RTFO. Um, now, I, I, I'm not sure quite what the committee would like me to do with it. We, we, we can sort of use fuel certified to RTFO, or we can say that's not an adequate test and sort of come back with an alternative, but I'm struggling to show, show what that would be at the moment, but I'm, I'm open to suggestions. Well, I think it's a reasonable suggestion that I'm coming up with there because actually it's, um, fuel is often tested. That's, it, it happens quite a lot um, to test, you know, if people are using red diesel in when they should be using white diesel, you know, and I think actually for me, um, I think um, if we were to start, it's not a difficult process to do, is to, to test what's in a fuel. Um, I think that actually perhaps we could go back and say, um, can we start making sure? Because as soon as palm oil is being dete is detected in the HVO, which allegedly is not going to be there, or you're hoping isn't, but there's no guarantee here in this in this um, accreditation that um, we can then say, oh no, we must not do this because clearly we're destroying the environment that we're trying to protect. Uh, you know, what what is another? 10 pound test to 200 and a quarter of a million pounds each year really is what I'm saying. So uh, yeah, it's, these, these tests can be done and it will tell you if it's present or not. So I do think that we do have to be very robust in this given the amount of money that the council is 
amount of taxpayers' money that's being spent on this, we must ensure that it isn't doing more damage to the climate. And therefore, I'm saying, just by saying, do not support the use of that. We need to be robust in our testing and the accreditation because we know that the accreditation is flawed. Thank you. You've got a comment, George? I'll uh, just start. I think the, fly, the flavour, whether well, that's appropriate in terms of a vegetable oil, um, is at the meeting is that we want to be sh assured about the robustness of the accreditation process. Not the cost, not the process, price, but assurance around that. So I think that's not an unreasonable request. How we do that, I don't know. It's beyond, beyond my, 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 my brain at the moment. But I think the proposal at the moment is that we use fuel certified by the, by the RTFO. Now, if, as an overview and scrutiny committee, having looked at the minutes of the climate change panel, whether that was considered, you feel that that, having sort of, if, if that is the view of the, the committee, well, I suppose we'd have to vote on that, that that is an inadequate form of certification, um, constitutionally, you could refer that concern to the Cabinet, who are the decision makers on this issue, and they would then have to sort of reconsider their decision in light of your suggestion. And we would decide that somehow or other we need, we need to sort of get this initiative over the line. And if it isn't to be this testing, it needs to be something else. Now, you could propose something back to the Cabinet. You can draft it, but I think that's the mechanism that we would need to go through. You want to come back in? So can I make the proposal then, the simple proposal, that we go back to Cabinet and ask that on an ad hoc basis, periodically, the fuel is tested, the HVO fuel is tested, to ensure that palm oil is not present in it. So have we got a, a second to follow up proposal? Okay, so the passing gum. Uh, and the reason, just making sure we're clarifying the reason for doing it, is we want some assurance around the accreditation, the robustness of the accreditation process. I am not... I am not doubting the renewable transport fuel obligation, but look at the word the obligation and do not support the use of. But we all know that there is importing, etc., of this. And we need to be very sure if this is a fuel that we're going to be using ongoing in our vehicles that it, that it isn't present. I can't, my own feeling is, there can, you know, imagine you do 10 tests and it's not present at all then you would be feeling, yeah, that's a good thing then. We've, we've held them to account, we've made sure, because we were going to be entirely sure that this was you know, economically viable, and we're doing it for environmental reasons, and therefore we need to make sure this is not an exorbitant cost to, to doing this, but it is ensuring that people are being held to account, and people are watching to see how robust we are as a council. And I really passionately believe that we should be doing this because the palm oil use of that is to some is endemic across um, HVO and we need to just hold people to account. It's what we do at Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Thank so, you. Yeah, just slightly rephrase that, that your, we want assurance that the expenditure will be providing the intended results. Yes. Kent Keith, you, you want to come in? I've, I've yeah, thanks Chair. Um, just to be clear on this proposal then, so um, at the moment, we've got, um, we're relying on a, um, an accreditation scheme that other councils are using. And the proposal is to in, bring in some sort of um, spot testing regime to validate the accreditation scheme. Is that my understanding? So uh, what I'd want to know is how are you going to ensure that you're making representative samples and that those tests are going to be repeatable? I don't know anything about the technicality of testing the oils, so we'd need to understand whether or not a spot testing regime is um, going to be reliable and how much it's going to cost and whether or not anybody else is doing it before we was to consider it, in my view. Yeah, I, I think, looking from my point of view of the minutes, I think... Oh, sorry. You, you don't have... Just because nobody else is doing it doesn't mean to say that we don't have to do it. You know, Stratford District Council has been a proud um, pioneer of this, of, of many things over the, over the years. You know, and it, it's, to make sure that it's robust, it's literally, you know, a tube of sampled fuel sent to the same 
organisation um, and done periodically. It's, it's not, a pardon the uh, Andy Crump pun, it's not rocket fuel science. I, I suspect that perhaps Councillor Littlewood might have a little bit more to do with knowledge about testing and robustness of testing, it, but uh, that's from his expertise of his background. Um, I just want to make sure that the money that we're spending here to, for climate reasons is being really well spent. It's being robust because it's that phrase there, we, don't, we do not support the use of, is not, we do not use. And that is critical. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, think, I think that is the phrase, isn't it? This is set the, the hairs running. Whether we have some clarification uh, that do not support the use of, in effect, means we do not use, full stop, I think we wouldn't have to be going down this process of potentially going through the dip-in process or, or going through questions. So, um, is, is, can, if, Noreen, do you want to come forward then? Um, if you can give us a reassurance, I think this is, Tony, you're right with this. Yeah. Yeah. I think what, what we, because, be, yeah, because the ambiguity of the, the minute of 580 did not support the use of this it gives the option or there's some slight leeway because it isn't precise enough that it could be used if we'd got some strong reassurance through this that confirm the council and the supplier which the contentials intends to use will not use will not use it full stop or, yeah I'm sure you, Tony can think of a better phrase than that. Yeah, I, I, th I think the issue, we, we are confusing two issues here, really. We're trying to second guess what this is, the fuel certification scheme says. What our commitment is, is to use fuel that is certified by um, the um, renewable transport fuel obligation. What we seem to now be trying to second guess is what, what qualities the fuel needs to meet to reach that. Um, and I, I'm not sufficiently aware of whether any element of palm oil is allowed within that, whether a small element, whether no palm oil is. Um, and I'm not sure what the climate change plan will be. I didn't attend the climate change panel, unfortunately, so I'm unable to, to inform the debate. Yeah, I know how to go before that bit came on. Um, to move this forward... Oh, sorry, Ryan. Yeah, yeah. You <laughs> Thank you. Now. Sorry. I, again, I, I wasn't sort of um, seeing this, so I've only just seen this. All I was going to say was, obviously, this whole... Um, the HVO, hydro-treated, hydronated vegetable oil, is going to be supplied as part of our contract with BIFA. BIFA are going to be um, supplying this oil, and they are supplying it to this RTFO standards. But they're not just supplying it to us. They are also... They have other um, fleets which they are running on this oil at the moment, and there are other fleets within um, uh, the district councils, and I can't remember off the top of my head, so if you have to apologise, <coughs> that are also running um, this hydro-treated, hydrogenated vegetable oil at the moment. And they are all running to this renewable transport fuel obligation. So I don't see why we need to do additional spot testing over the top when as um, other councils are also running their refuse trucks to this level. Obviously, officers can go to, you know, they are, you know, I can go to a much deeper level, but, um, and I will you know, get some more information from them. I, I suppose I, what I would like to know, I, I think that we need to perhaps have something on the work program about this. What I would like to know, just because other councillors that do it, they might have different standards. They might say, yes, we will have 25% of it palm oil we have said that we don't support the use of palm oil and I assume that meant no palm oil um, so I think if we could have some clarification on this I, I'm whilst I'm keen that we need to get the information out I, I don't think we've got the information really to make a proposal back to cabinet to ask them to change something so I will bring back in the rain. Um, so I think as a matter of urgency, we get more of a breakdown. What's behind this? I think members and councillors have got some idea of what we're looking for now. We haven't got a flavour. 
And again, I can't think of a better word than flavour, but uh, I'm going to have to use that. Um, so if we can come back with the details of what the accreditation means, whether that has any palm oil in, whether these other councils are using palm oil in their supplies, because if they are using those councils. So I think if we have some clarity, it might preempt something having to go back to council at uh, cabinet uh, to make a decision. So I don't think we've got 100% of the details on, on this. Um, oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I had got concerns that we needed to address this further and myself and my officer Julie Lewis are appearing at the next climate change panel to go into more detail on such things as what's appearing in the um, latest groundswork contract and also, you know, some details about um, the HVO. Yeah, so that's about the 23rd, 24th of April. So it's obviously about two weeks' time. So I don't like pushing things down the road, but I would rather we got the information and then had a debate at the next OSC about this, and then we, we discuss it. So can I make a request, Councillor Croker, about the next meeting at a climate change panel, which hopefully I should be there, um, that you've heard our concerns about any uses of palm oil. We need really need to tighten that minute down on, on 580, just so we're clear, because uh, it does not support the use of, but it doesn't say we don't use it, does it? It's you know, a bit ambiguous. So I think if we tighten that up, we get all the details of what will be as part, whether any palm oil is uh, used, what other councils are using you can get from Biffa, and then we can then come back here to say, yes, we've discussed this, and minute 580 of the climate change panel wasn't uh, precise enough. So therefore, and again, that's no criticism of officers, by the way. Uh, I think we need to just be clear. So I'm happy, I would, my proposal would be that we defer any decision on this to after the next climate change panel of the 24th of April, where we've got the information and then come bring it back to where we see. Yeah. All right then, so Councillor Grocott, here's a simple question to ask Biffa, because they're going to be using these people. Here's the question. The killer question is, can you guarantee that palm oil is not used in the HVO, the end? That's all it is. Can you guarantee that palm oil is not used in the HVO that you'll be using to power these vehicles? And that's it. Because what is going to be happening is, and nobody realised what we're saying is, the testing of this HVO is going to be coming to the fore. And imagine the lack, imagine the balloon that will go up when it said that Stratford District Council have been spending all, and other councils have been spending all this money and blow me down, it's got palm oil. The damage this has caused is... Is, is huge and that is all I'm trying to do here is to obviate, obviate reputational damage which is the purpose of the overview and scrutiny committee so the question is can you guarantee that this HVO does not contain palm oil if they say we can't guarantee it then you need to make some very good decisions thank you very much indeed that's a grow card apologies for using your first name yeah, I'm just slightly concerned sort of, that we're stepping over the constitutional sort of ability of the committee here because um, the only thing that on, is on your agenda today is to make comments on the minutes for the um, um, climate change panel. And I'm very happy for you to make comments on that. The decision about HVO and the use of that in vehicles has been made by the correct body of the council, which is the cabinet. Now, that decision was subject to call-in or prior discussion at the OSC, I don't remember which, and the correct channels, I understand, were, were followed there. So we have an extant decision of Cabinet to use HVO, subject to agreeing a suitable certification scheme, which was to be presented to the Climate Change Panel for agreement. Now, I understand that that process has been followed, and I'm not really sure that we can call in the decision to use HVO through this route. I, I think we are 
I'd need to take advice from the monitoring office on it. Well, with respect, it seems that we are. We're delaying the implementation to we've agreed a testing regime, I think is what's being proposed by the... I'm not quite clear what we are proposing, but if you want to make a query on the minutes, that's well within the sort of remit of the group. But um, I think beyond that, I'd have to take advice as to whether, whether sorry, we turn I don't it forward. Think, I think what we... There wasn't a vote on the proposal anyway, and the only thing I proposed was that we bought this was going to be going to the climate change panel on the 24th of April and we asked the portfolio holder to, for, to be mindful of the comments from OSC at that meeting and present information that is unambiguous and we referenced palm oil and then when those minutes were completed they would come back to OSC and we would discuss it then. So I thought that's where we got to, so therefore we're not circumventing any constitutional processes. So to be clear then, what we're doing is we're going to make a comment back on the climate change panel saying that the Overview and Scrutiny Committee expressed concern about the reference to palm oil in the um, climate change minutes and asked that to be referred back to the Committee for Clarification. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Right. We all happy now? Good. Right, I think we'll move on. Um, I can say I don't want to palm you off there, uh, Councillor Littlewood. <laughs> then come on. Work, work plan. Um, Councillor Johnston, you, you want to raise a suggestion to do with, with the work plan? Councillor Keithley, and I, you know, I did right, okay. say I was going to bring him before, and I do apologise, Councillor Keithley. That's okay, Chair. Thank you. Um, I did have a point on these um, minutes of the climate change panel before you move on to yep, something on. else, if that's okay. So I got distracted, and I could tell. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah. So um, my. You know, if you're going to make an observation on the minutes of these climate change panel minutes. Yeah, the content. Um, what I would like to express is some um, potential opportunity to, to um, streamline the reporting. Because what I find is when I look at the, the last climate change action plan update, which um, it has a red, amber, green update against it. And I've, I've got it on my phone here. It's still dated... March 22, that was the last update, as, as shown on the website. Um, there are a number of, of um, objectives and a, a number of actions on that, on that plan. Um, there, are 17, s there are 17 actions on, on the minutes of the climate change panel, but it's very difficult since most of them have yet to be confirmed anyway, but it's very difficult to cross-reference these with the plan and the timescales that's the formal climate change action plan. They don't sit very well together. They're not properly aligned. This seemed like a, a, a subset of other actions that don't refer back to our core document. You need to be able to bring everything back to one place so that things are referenced back um, with timescales and actions. I also note the, um, the comment in these minutes that there is to be a, um, a climate change strategy to be produced and updates provided. I thought we'd already got a climate change strategy, to be honest, but um, this is something new. So... What I'm really saying in summary is that these sorts of presentations need to be aligned back to the core plan so that we can see how it all fits together. So, for example, projections for electric vehicle charging strategy to be provided, where does that link back into our core climate change emergency action plan? So I think there's an opportunity to perhaps refine this and better align some of this information. So otherwise, it's very confusing, and it's very difficult to see from what's presented in these uh, climate change panel minutes. It's very difficult to see how they align to our 
overall plan. Thank you. Yeah, and I think you've just built on what Councillor Rolf and I were saying about uh, having the portfolio holder to come uh, to, to the committee uh, and our concerns. Uh, so I think you've you know, um, alluded to, or not alluded to, you brought to the fore that we've got these concerns and they need to be, like I say, we've got concerns about timescales, we've got concerns about language, we've got concerns about benchmarking, measurabilities. So it needs needs a bit of a refresh. And in the same way, we were talking about SIL allocations and that officer working group, working with the South Rockshire local plan, there should be some form of coordination of, of the, the, the policies from the climate change panel. So I think lots of the information is there, but not necessarily in the right place and it's not necessarily linked in and aligned. So I've, it, it needs to be conciser and, and, and smarter. So I think you just sort of you know, saying about the concerns, that Aaron, our, our concerns on that. Councillor Passingham, please. I know, I know time's getting on. Um, but um, yeah, uh, th there is a lot Sorry, of David. items on this. Sorry schedule yeah. and there's a lot to be completed and or, or and to be confirmed and uh, i'm just wondering if there's enough resources uh, to complete this program at the moment i mean for the, the the climate emergency motion was passed five years ago for four years of that there was no officers working on it uh, last year an officer was appointed who's got a lot of work to do um, as i understand it um, Warwick District has got 10 people who are working up to three days a week on the climate emergency and, and doing something about it. And uh, uh, it just seems having one think, person... Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that's going to be a question for when the portfolio holder comes. Right, OK. Yep. Okay. But I well, just the portfolio holder is here already. She'll have the answer to it straight away when we do that. Uh, right. Anybody else on that before we move on? Councillor Johnson, I do apologise for interrupting you while you're in full flow on the work plan, but something came well, out and it was my fault. So, far away, please. We would like to ensure that uh, the County Council highways um, are scrutinised by this committee, given the management of roadworks in this district and the disruption that is being caused, uh, loss of business, um, ex more expensive travel, and it's a matter of urgency because the activity is going on now and we would like to ask that the County Council Cabinet Member for Highways comes to this committee at its next meeting on the 31st of May. They've got six weeks warning so that we can ask questions about how the decision making goes on. Can, yeah, I've, I've no problems with that, Councillor Johnson. Can we give them a couple of dates, just so in case there's a bit more leeway? And can we also be quite precise? You know, can we have some questions or set some questions or some ideas, areas of interest, what we want to look at? You know, because I think there's obviously network management. There's implications from broadband contractors who are potentially causing problems. I you know the A439. They got some money from roads, um, the highways agency, or something like that. Um, uh, but I think it's the management of the whole process, isn't it? And but I think if we can have some questions as well, I've got no problems. One inviting, I think it was actually part of the um, climate change panel about uh, speaking to the yeah, uh, reschedule council plan of scrutiny that was on page eight of the um. Of the, of the agenda. So I think we've got the principle there, um, but I'm more than happy that we don't. Uh, Councillor Roth, please. Yeah, um, I don't think we need to have the SIL discussion. We've had one already today. It's due in May. I don't think we need it, do we? Do yeah, we? Well, I think that's probably a hangover from the scheme that's no longer going ahead, well, where you correct. would have had to start having yeah. an early look at the proposal. So no, I think I'd probably agree with that. So, so we've got we can fit in um, highways there. Yeah, if, if, if I can attend, and if we, it would be good that we have uh, areas and themes that we want to be talking about. Most of them were probably quite obvious anyway, but I think we, we need to talk about that. Uh, Councillor Orcott, please. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I would like to request that substitutes are allowed when members cannot make meetings for on this committee. Okay, um, so because if you're going to have meetings in the middle of the school summer holidays yeah, and during the half terms oh, and during Easter, yeah. it does create problems when with the holidays being booked not just to the parent of children at school but i also know we have grandparents who take on child care responsibilities substitutions on this committee i think is something that really needs to be looked at because otherwise i do i am worried that we will not you you could end up in a situation of not being quiet yeah i'll, I'll come back yep may i just follow up on that uh, i think I think I would like to ask if we can, uh, both Councillor Alcock and myself are not here on the 31st of May because it's holiday. Um, and I would like to ask for special dispensation to have two substitutes on that day, if that's possible. Yes, I, I think. I think we need to check this with the monitoring officer because I've, I've got something in the back of my mind that says for some reason we don't have substitutes on OSC. So again, we'll ask for the monitoring officer, ask for the special dispensation, um, and we'll get back to the officers. We'll get back to you as soon as possible. Yeah. Can I see Wally Huggins, please? Sorry yeah, I'm entirely sympathetic with um, Councillor Alcock's proposal, but I do think that this is something that needs to be looked at across committees, um, and that maybe this isn't the although we have that meeting imminently, that maybe this is something that we need to address or for the, for, um, the management of, yeah. of the council now need to address moving yeah. forward because that would make this um, more family friendly. I, th I, think it, I think it's something that we need to look at globally rather than just within overview and scrutiny committee. And I think it's, it's, it's easier done elsewhere than just within OSC for that, for that, meet for that meeting. But, but Thank you. I'm afraid I must... Yeah. Go, yeah. Right? But, but O and S are the only committee that don't have substitutes. I think Every it's in the constitution. Has. I think really we need to look at it. So uh, and again, perhaps it might be a future item for this yeah. this panel to look at. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Then, if I can, chair, mm -hmm. is actually to look at the calendar of meetings across every committee. And ensuring that the Walsh County Council school holidays, which are already out now for the next two years, I think it is, are actually taken into consideration when all meetings, and it's something we need to scrutinise as a work programme then, I think, on this committee, is to look into that. That is, that is what we, we can do. Mm. And I, I think we, that's something we, we do need to consider. Yeah, I think it's something we, we, we can debate and but I think it's audit and standards, maybe. But go on, Howard. Yeah, so, so the, the responsibility, the committee is responsible for overseeing the constitution and for the and agreeing the calendar of meetings is audit and standards. So that's the the, um, the democratic body that really like, reviews that. So um, it's not within our remit as a committee of the overview and scrutiny committee, I'm afraid. But we, we could write to the chair of um, audit and standards, couldn't we? And. Uh, uh, Express our concerns. So, yeah. Anything else on that? Or are we, are we happy on that one? Right, Councillor Wally Huggins, yeah, you disappear if you want. Uh, I've got no other urgent business, so I declare the meeting closed at 12.45.